And here we are, it's part, it's talking bollocks again. It's happening again. It is 2019. That's right. It is five years since the very first Bollocast was launched. That was January 2014. Here we are, January 2019. And you know what's really weird is that time has flown. Absolutely flown. So welcome, welcome one, welcome all. This is Talking Bollocks. I am Head of the Bollocks. My name is Howard H. Smith. Um, I am singer in UK thrash band Acid Rain. I am also a stand-up comedian, keithplatt.co.uk, acidrain.co.uk. Does anybody use websites anymore? Um, You can also find Keith Platt and Acid Rain. And Talking Bollocks, for that matter, all over social media. Talking Bollocks, often spelt with a Z on the end instead of an S. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the intro out the way. It is good to be back. Now, slight change. Normally, this would be... This is this is the first podcast of the year, so normally I would do all of my um, favourite... To, well, favourite tunes, favourite albums from um, 2018, which I'm not going to do, because um, that was all done on the live podcast that Godless and I did uh, just over a week ago in Camden. Um, I have got it recorded, so that will be um, that will be released at some point this month. I would have thought as a, as an extra for you, um, Patreon listeners, of course, have already got it. Um, as always, you know, if you'd like to sign up at Patreon, then please do. It's patreon.com forward slash Howard H. Smith. Five dollars a month. Uh, I think it's six dollars in total or five ninety eight or something like that, um, including tax. So, uh, yeah, a bit like the five ninety eight EP by Metallica all those years ago. Hey, that's where the um, similarities end in fact. So, uh, lots of awesome content every month that nobody else gets. You also get a bollo cast of your own. So, um, two people being interviewed um, coming up on this show, obviously, are um, Ol Rake um, and, uh, and also Miles from uh, BMG. Now, um, uh, patron subscribers were all given um, the option of asking questions to them, which they have. And, um, and so, there's a little side uh, podcast made up as well, which is just for Patreon listeners. So if you want to sign up, if you don't, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 okay, yeah, right, lovely, right, great, marvelous. Okay, so there you go. No, nothing's broken. That's just me. Um, so what has been going on in the world of metal? recently um well it should a, a bit of a side bit of a sidebar here um radio bollocks is out again second uh, the second episode that's january's radio bollocks is out now um so go over to the talking bollocks youtube channel that is the only place that you can listen to radio bollocks um there's also going to be a new podcast coming up not quite sure when i'm going to get it started i've got a couple of interviews already done um but it's going to be talking movie bollocks so um yeah just uh, basically people people that you know um from bands uh some people from the from the um entertainment industry some comedians um I'm going to have some um hopefully Emmy and award winning um writers and editors on as well so if you're into you know if you're into um into the movies then uh, yeah you you're going to enjoy that anyway okay um, what's been going on? Well, what's been going on is I went to see uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, um, or Bo Rap, as no one is calling it, and really enjoyed it. You see how I just moved from movies into a music movie there? That was nice and smooth, wasn't it? Notice how I just pointed it out, which is not smooth at all. Anyway, couldn't resist. Um, uh, and I really, really enjoyed it. Funnily enough, I've just got back from seeing um, Joel Diaz. Um, at uh, at Sony, um, he of Music for Nations, and we we we've just been having a chat about Acid Rain and everything. And he's um, he uh, he has his issues with um, a Bohemian Rhapsody, which we talked about um, for the uh, a future podcast. But anyway, I really enjoyed it. Um, it is a very mainstream uh, take, a very mainstream family movie um, uh, for you know a movie of Freddie Mercury's life because obviously uh, he did live life to excess. Um, but you know, as a big Queen fan, I was I, I I didn't mind the liberties taken with timelines and bits and pieces and all the rest of it. I just went in wanting to enjoy a film. You know, I didn't go in with my Queen nerd hat on, going, "Oh, hang on, it wasn't that song that they played at the BBC. It was this one." And it's like, you know, there's enough 
fucking documentaries out there if that's what you want to see. If you just want to see a fucking big old enjoyable Queen movie with Queen songs, then, you know, it's 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 your movie for you. And I thought Remy Malek was awesome, more than worthy of an Oscar nomination, and I'm really glad he's got that. So there you go. Uh, we've started off with movies, but it was a movie about music, music so let's move on, shall we? Um, there's a new band out called Presto Ballet. Yes, Presto Ballet. Um, and if you're thinking, mm, Howard, that's a shit name, then I'm right there with you. Um, it is a bit of a, it's, it's not great. It's, um, it's Kurt van der Hoof, he of Metal Church. Um, and he's doing a little bit, something out on the side. Uh, so, uh, and the, the song um, is called um, Out of Mind, It's Outer Sight, right? Out of Mind, It's Outer O U T T A site, um, and all I can describe it is, it, 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 I don't know. It's like, it's like Rush when they had their really shit period in the eighties. It's like that, except not as good. Um, it's like Naff Rush meets eighties AOR. Um, I mean, if it was a, you know, if it was a flavor, it would be vanilla. Um, it, which side of the road would it be? It would be straight down the middle. I mean, it is literally like wearing beige. Like eating paint, like hearing wind, it's just like I, I, seriously. The I mean, I've, I've probably said this on the podcast before. In fact, I know I have. I've said this a few times. Fucking, hell, I sound like Jamie. I sound like Jamie Jaster now. Um, I've probably said it a few times, but um, the worst thing I, I would ever say that anybody could say about music is they're like meh. You know, it doesn't really um, doesn't really bother me. Um, you know, and t- that's exactly what it was. I was just like, do you know what? I don't like this. I don't hate this. It it is just, yeah, it's just there, really. That's it. Um. So anyway, there you go. Um. Uh. And also, I, I liked. Um. I like uh, moving on. Uh, what's been going on in the news? Uh, Sebastian back telling um telling Skid Row that well, hang on, you've had seven singers since I left. Maybe it's you lot who are hard to deal with, um, which was which was pretty fair enough, really, if you think about it. Pretty pretty fair enough, um, and um, and obviously Godless owes me. You'll you'll hear about um, uh, the fact that obviously we uh, we disagreed because I he reckoned that there was going to be a, an original Skid Row uh, reunion this year. Of course, there wasn't. So there you go. Um, uh, and what else been going on? Um, I, I mean, in case I've mentioned it before, uh, movie over Christmas, Bros. When the Screaming Stops. Um, it's on the BBC iPlayer. If you can get a chance to see it streaming somewhere, Bros. When the Screaming Stops is hilarious. The most unintentionally hilarious music film I've ever seen. Um, I, just really, really enjoyable. Re- I mean, especially having the amount of years I've spent in a band. Um in my life and just seeing the way that they the way it comes together and everything else is it's just it's excellent it really is worth a watch i know you might have heard um a lot of people uh, talking about it it's definitely definitely worth seeing um uh, another story new story was uh, Lars Ulrich um we have this fear of repetition and this fear of falling into the same cycle well obviously not the same touring cycle because um uh, he seemed quite happy with that uh, at their Lars i mean I just, I'm not feeling it. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm, I, I, I don't, I don't feel it. I, it just doesn't ring true to me that, that you know, that, that we have this fear of repetition and this fear of falling into the same cycles. Um, I mean, it just doesn't ring true to me. I, I don't think, I don't think if you have, if you have, if you had that kind of fear, you wouldn't constantly record. Um, in your own rehearsal studios, with your own hand-picked engineer, with nobody um, pushing you out of your comfort zone, uh, just wor- working completely um, happily and co- in a cosseted situation where everyone's just going to tell you everything you're doing is great. I don't think that really um, fosters a um, oh we're not going to keep we're, we're not going to repeat ourselves kind of um, atmosphere, if one will know what I'm talking about I'm fucking I'm lost <laughs> lovely thank you so um 
Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I do harp on about Metallica. They even came up in the uh, in the live podcast as well, um, which you know, to be fair, is really enjoyable. I I hope you're going to really enjoy it. Anyway, I really do. Um, I really do. I really, 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 really hope you enjoy it. I really do. Um, so uh, the one thing I will say about 2018, because I'm not reviewing um, uh, my favorite albums, but one thing um, I, I am gonna say is um for me 2018 was a pretty sucky year when it uh, when it comes to new music um really shit to be honest um uh, i mean if i was to do a top five i was struggling i was struggling to do a top five i ended up with about a top three a genuine top three i could have, i could have done a top five but two of them i you know i just I don't know. I've just been a really, really disappointing year for me. Um, I don't know what anyone else thinks. Um, obviously, I don't because, you know, it's not a phone in. <laughs> but I'd be interested to hear what you guys think um, uh, of last year as a year. I mean, having just got over Christmas, um, I went into uh, I went into HMV. Funnily enough, the day that it was announced that they were going to be going to receivership. I mean, everybody working there had like, you know, red eyes. I really did feel sorry for them. Um, and um, and I purchased the remastered and Justice for All and the remastered um, Chaos AD. Now Chaos AD, I cannot speak highly enough of. Oh my god, the um, the remaster sounds fucking immense. Um, there is a another disc of bits and pieces, extra tracks, demos, but also live tracks. Um, the second disc of live tracks is fucking awesome. Seriously, that that Chaos AD remaster is an absolute beast. Fucking loving it. Um, and there you go. Look, there, there I am raving about two fucking albums that are how old? That, I, that And I'm buying remasters of them. And I'm still not able to come up with five albums that really blew me away in 2018. Um, it is. It's pretty fucking sad. The other thing I got for, uh, for for Christmas that I didn't purchase myself, I had purchased for me, was a Forty Years of Queen book, which is just absolutely amazing. It's it's pieced together with all sorts of um, uh, old um, bits and pieces in it, like posters, backstage passes, little promo things. I mean, it's an and it, it's absolutely brilliant. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I've been slowly picking my way through that. Um, since Christmas, which has given me great fun, I must say. So anyway, guys, I have been jibbering jabbering for a little while now. What say we get on one of the interviews? Yeah, right, Howard, that sounds like a good idea. Yep. We, are we, we cool with that, guys? Yep. Okay, right. So thanks for your feedback. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight in there um, with my old mucker, Ulrake, um, from... Evile, yes. Um, we, I, I, mean, I haven't, I haven't. This is the first time that I've had any kind of dealings in inverted commas um, with Evile whatsoever. We've just our paths have never crossed. Um, I don't think any of us have ever met. So um, this was a chance to uh, to have a chat with all um, and and really just kind of say hello. He's very much into his movies as well. So we're going to be doing a um, an interview for the movie podcast um, at some point as well. Um, but until that comes up. This is myself and all having a chat a few weeks ago. Hello. Hello there. Is that H? It is indeed. Is that all? How are you doing? Yeah, it is. Excellent, excellent. I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm not bad. I, I actually messaged you to say I can't do seven, but just now I can do it so that you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that is insane. What, um, on Twitter? Yeah, yeah, I missed you saying, oh, sorry, man, I'm going to have to cancel, but you just got to now when you rang, and I was like, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's bizarre. I, yeah, I didn't get, I did not get a, um, I did, yeah, I didn't get anything. Hashtag cunt. Nice one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, we've made it happen, mate. We've made it happen. That's the yeah. main thing. Yeah, all good. All good. All good. So, um, so uh, what are you doing with yourself at the moment? Uh, it sounds a bit, it sounds a bit chaotic. Have you, is it, uh, is this what happens with uh, Christmas and children? Yeah, oh, it's, it's an amalgamation of Christmas children, Mrs. Job, Evile, 
and just trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trying yeah. to get some sleep in somewhere. God, it's not easy. So, so um, what are you um, what are you working at? What's uh, what's the job? Um, I'm a, an operations manager for a, a couple of companies over in Huddersfield. Uh, a textile um, treating company. It's like a revolutionary thing where we shoot plasma and lasers into fabrics to treat them instead of like using dyeing chemicals and loads of water. Um, other one's an engineering company, and the other one's a music company. Right. Okay. So, so did you impress? Did you impress them with your knowledge of logistics, having been in a band? And as we all know, being in a band yeah. involves a lot of logistics. Yeah, funnily enough, it, it was the the band experience. It was like, well, you've been all over the world and managed tours, so you must be all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got there. You got back. And... Yeah, you're alive. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it's 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 surprising, like the transferable skills. As soon as you put something like uh, being in a band on a CV, I think people go a little bit starry eyed, and they uh, sometimes they want to get you in for an interview just to have a chat. Yeah, true. I think it can be both ways. I've had some that um, have said like, "Oh, wow, how you were in a band?" Then others saying, "Oh, so what was your real job? What yeah. what did you do on the side?" It's like, "No, I did that. Like, that's all I did." And they're like, "Oh, really?" Yeah, and that's it. You know, you're again. But that's that's yeah. great because the people who are doing it. Oh, but what was your real job? Are uh, are uh, clearly have a hidden agenda, and there's something you know. There's something that they wish they'd done in their lives that they never did. Yeah, um, yeah. Look, look what this guy's done, and I've just sat on this office chair. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not 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 a gr- not a great feeling for them, but you know, fuck them. No. Um, yeah. So, so basically, since it, it, during your time out of Evile, you've just basically been able to find a little bit more balance in your life, by the sounds of it. Yeah, I, I think. Well, I didn't even intend to rejoin Evile. It was just I left because you know I couldn't financially do it anymore, and I think I, I missed out on a lot because I it was like twenty four seven for me. I, I wrote music all the time. I emailed everyone. And, I sign everything out. It's like I'd wake up and that'd be my my day would just be evile. Yeah. And I got to the point where I just said, I just don't want to do this anymore. It's like we did um, a gig in Taiwan. I think it was like twelve thousand miles round trip. We were away for five days. We played for thirty minutes, and I think I made ten pound. Yeah. And I know it's the privilege of have been able to do that was great. But it's just like that that's not worth it you know and you know got the baby coming well baby planned at the time and then you know it just didn't make sense so yeah took some time out um got a little girl um got a normal job <laughs> yeah and started doing my solo stuff and then you know just a bit of a dabble and then something happened with eva i was talking to matt and um i, I think i jokingly said like oh i'll I'll do it if, you know, if the opportunity comes up. You went, all right. And that was it. <laughs> so so you, <laughs> you accidentally rejoined? Yeah, I, yeah, it was an accident, really. It was just like, because I, I, I did miss it, and I, I loved doing it, but it was just, you know, there's things about being in the band, you'll know yourself that, that are the bad things, and there's the good things. And I think I concentrated on the bad things and just remember, like, you know what, it is actually fun, so... Give it another go. The thing is, though, I I do appreciate your position because that's been that's always been me, and that is me to this day. Which is, you know, be being the sort of business behind the band and being the public face of the band, and you know, yeah. managing social media and everything else and the business side. And it is it is all consuming, and it and it can you've you've really got to compartmentalize because it's yeah. it's. Um, it can really drain drain all the fun out of it for you, which, by the sounds of it, it, it did. Yeah, I think it became a mental drain as well. It's just that uh, like, I love writing music, and that's you know I wake up and I want to do that. But all all the travelling, sleeping on cabs, and not eating, you know, it's just it's, it's just you know, it's fifty fifty. It's great, and it's also not, but the great is really good. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is as well is that all those things you've just described don't actually... It's hard enough, ba- you know, band members getting along together as it is. 
But then when you throw in a lack of sleep and, and a lack of food, it's 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 a miracle any band survives any tours. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I, I remember one we did, um, I was not know any names, but someone booked the tour and we, we arrived. It was in Scandinavia. And they're like, hi, who are you? I'm like, oh, Eli. So, um, we're, we're playing. And we're, no one told us. And for some reason, on this run we did, we'd been booked on the tour, but I purposely hadn't been told, well, they didn't tell us from us that we were playing, so every gig we were turning up to, there was no rider, no no money, no no anything. And like, I think we did one gig where the promoters, like, felt sorry for us and got, got us one pizza. And that was like the course of four or five days and then we came off the tour. So, that is that awesome. That is insane. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't fun. <laughs> I mean, so presumably you weren't playing to many people either, if if nobody knew you were on. Um, no, I, th- I think we were first first on maybe, and um, you know it was like club shows, but right. We were maybe playing to like twenty percent of the intended crowd, you know. But yeah, yeah, we got to go to Scandinavia. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's 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 one way of looking at it. Yeah, um, yeah. dear me. Um, I, I look, I, just going off on a tangent for a minute, which I'm apt to do. Um, yeah, I actually looked at a little bit of your um, your sort of biography, and um, I am incredibly, incredibly gen- jealous because um, one of my favourite performers is Tim Minchin. Oh yeah. Um, you bastard! You. That, he's he's such a nice guy and he's such a cool guy as well. It was actually just a mere fluke that that even happened. Our um, manager at the time met him like a few nights before this tweet went out. And just said, "Oh, I'm a manager man called Eva blah, blah blah," and then he tweeted saying, oh, "I'm playing Sonic Two. Does anyone know any guitarists that might want to join me for a song?" And everyone was like, our fans were like, oh, I got off from Evile. And then I think it must have clicked that he met our manager and she said Evile. And he must have replied saying, oh, yeah, that'd be cool. And then it just happened. And I was in his dressing room learning a song in 10 minutes. <laughs> to play it like an hour later. Brilliant. It was, well, one of the, fun, the funniest things, it was like quite, not smile to I guess Wayne's World. Um, if I didn't know the song, it was just like, do you know how to play a stair with heaven or is that a stupid question? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a stupid question. <laughs> um well I know I know the song Rock and Roll Nerd. Um Yeah, it's a good song. So were you just were you just providing some sort of some extra backing for it? Yeah, I think like um two thirds into the song I came on and did like solo with him. Oh, and right. I'm I'm fully aware of the uh, um intention of me being the, the subject of the, the song. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's it's a hell of a tune. I know, I, you know, I, I fucking love the guy. He's an absolute genius. Um, yeah, he is. But wow, getting to perform with him, that is just, that's fucking amazing. That really is. Yeah, it was good. There's a, there's a picture somewhere of me and him, like, air rehearsing. He's like air pianoing. <laughs> I'm air guitaring the song to each other. It's just the most bizarre experience. <laughs> <laughs> that is fucking brilliant. Oh, it's like going to the dad that did it, and I'm saying, also, I come in and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, mate, that is awesome. Um, well, apologies for the tangent, but I, I like, yeah, I, as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, man, I am. Yeah, you bastard. Yeah, I am totally. I am absolute jealousy. Um, I really am. And uh, funnily enough, we we've got. Well, I, I I wouldn't say a connection, but um, I um I I nearly joined Destruction um, after Schmier left back in the. Oh early, really? Yeah, back in the early nineties. Um, it was wow. it was something that was being sorted out by then. Um, their management at the time, which was Bear Dawn Productions, which was Eric Cook and Tony Bray, you know, a.k.a. Right. Abaddon. 
Um, and mm. they invited me up and basically said, look, Steam Hammer uh, uh, want Destruction to get an album out. It's 50,000 sales no matter what happens. Um, but they're a singer short. Shmir's left. Would you be up for it? And I was like, well, yeah, if they're up for it. And they went, you know. So they bunged him a CD of um, our then album, Obnoxious. And, um, mm. and then a couple of weeks went by and I got a phone call from Ollie, the drummer. Um, and, uh, and he was like, oh, you know, you know, I got the, I was like, all right, you know, you know, what do you think of the album? He goes, oh, it's great. I fucking love your vocals, man. I was like, all oh, right, thanks a lot. And he was like, yeah, heavy, but you know, you've got melody in there. It's great. And I was like, cool. Right. So, you know, do you want to do this then? He was like, yeah, let's do it. Never heard from him again. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. That's, oh, that would have been great. That's the music business for you though, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Never hear from him again. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, nothing. Total silence. Um, oh, that would have been great, though. That would have been really good. Oh, man. I, I mean, it, it was all, we had it all planned. I was flying out there two weeks on, two weeks off, write the album and um, and get cracking. But, um, but yeah, it never happened. And funnily enough, I, um, I, uh, I interviewed Schmier a couple of years ago and told him that story. And he said... To, he said, "Yeah, that sounds like Ollie. You know, that's you know, <laughs> like saying yeah, saying yeah, let's do it, and then nothing happening. Yeah, that sounds like Ollie. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to mention it to him when I go home. Um, but um, so um, so so how was um, how was putting a solo album together? Because I, I I you know, whilst you are mainly in charge of that, there's also you want to get a load of guests on, and all of a sudden you're kind of juggling other people's diaries again, and it's all a bit." You know, it's it's all a bit logistics again. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the things I started noticing as well. Oh, I don't like this now. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, when we we did our fourth album, Skull, and that was the last one with Eric, and I sent an email to I think Dig and Dan just saying, um, you know, just thanks for everything, thanks for all the work you've done for us, and it was a pleasure to work with you. And I think they said, oh, we want to carry on working with you. Do you want to do, like, an album of just shredding? I'm like, uh, yeah, okay. So just put all that together. It was, it was quite easy. I suppose it was just me to answer to, and I just did it in my own time. Yeah. And um, I got to a point where I thought, hey, it would be cool to get some guests. So I, I purposely wrote a song with gaps just for other people's solos and called it guitarists playing guitars because I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> 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 and they got Gary Holt on it and uh, James Murphy uh, Josh from Silosis and uh, a few other friends it was yeah, it was, it was fun it was great it was just it was hard to get it recorded because it was just all on me but we had um, Mike Heller the Fear Factory live drummer who had James Murphy knew and, and got him to play on it and you know it was, it was amazing but otherwise it was going to be um, programmed drums which yeah. we didn't really want to do yeah well, James, yeah, James is a top man, isn't he? And uh, and oh, yeah, you know, and and, and he knows everyone. Um, yeah, apparently, <laughs> it's insane, absolutely insane. And and of course, how do you so? How do you know Gary? Um, we toured with Exodus in two thousand eight. We did like a, a bus share with them, and um, you know, I didn't know them before that. We just got on the tour through um, our agency and just got to know them through. Two or two. It was really good. I remember we we turned up to meet the bus in London, and Gary came and said, "Hi right, guys, nice to meet you. We, we've left you um, presents on on the on your bunks." We we're like, oh, "Wow, Gary from Exeter is leaving his presents on our bunk." So we got in the bus, and it was loads of gear porn. <laughs> hey! <laughs> oh, great thanks. But but mysteriously, it all disappeared. <laughs> I had no idea. What happened. I said, there's something about there's something about thrash bands and buying gay porn. It's, it's, this is yeah, not the first gay porn thrash band story I've heard. Well, metal in, as a whole is something quite you know. It's always penises drawn on the wall. It's never anything else. True, true. A bit of an over obsession with it. To be fair, yeah. Well, I mean, we draw penises all over our fucking all over our own albums. So um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely you took it a bit further, but <laughs> yeah, definitely something homoerotic going on. Um, yeah, that's that's insane because you you toured with Exodus about twenty years after we did. <laughs> oh bloody hell! I know. What I year know. was that? What year? Um, eighty nine. Wow, I was 
five. Yay! <laughs> this guy, wow. this guy right here is old. <laughs> um, I will ask. No, I'm 48, mate. 48 and proud of it. Oh, wow. um, absolutely. Every day above ground. It's a good one, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, that, God, that's that's insane. Um, I'm, I'm all over the map here, so, like, you know, questions might fly out all over the shop. No, no. Um, how is your relationship with your brother after you kind of turning around and saying, look, I don't want to do this anymore? Fine. Like, even when I... Um... When it was happening, it was just like, I think it was just understood. He was just like, yeah, fair enough. I think he understood and, and actually felt some of the same things. And not that I think he was going to quit, but he, he was like, yeah, I understand. So yeah. we spoke the whole time. I was not in Eva as well. So not nothing changed between anyone at all. It was just, you know, I can't do this anymore. Bye. <laughs> that's fair enough. That's, re that's really yeah. cool. So everybody was like adult about it. Yeah. Yeah, it was really amicable. It was, it was great. And um, and can you can you say if you're working on new material or not? Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, I think Matt had been working on it anyway, when, when, even before I was back. But um, when, when I rejoined, I I kind of said, look, I spent so much time on the first four, well, maybe two, three, four, and I, I just don't want to commit that much time because you know it takes me six months to write one song sometimes because I'm I'm that anal over everything and so I can't do that anymore and then it's just kind of fallen back into place that yeah I, I think I want to write again <laughs> I'm right. back at it again but Matt's writing as well and then we just bring it all into the rehearsal room and just jam it out really how close um, how close are you to having something to, to go in the studio with oh not close I think we've got maybe 10 songs started ah right maybe okay. two, two or three to the point where there's skeletons there but you know, we're it's, it's just as it comes. I, I'm hoping that we can get it out in 2019, but I, w I wouldn't promise it because you yeah. know things change. Well, same here. We're just getting first mixes of uh, first mix of the first song, hopefully in the next few days, and um, it's going to be end of 2019 before anything gets out. Um, but yeah, it's um, insane how long it takes, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Well, especially when you've got no label, because I mean, as as I'm sure you'll find. You know, I mean, we want to, we want to shop this and and get the best home possible for it. Um, yeah. And there's, you know, there's deals on the table, but not necessarily that I that Good I think. Are, well, not that necessarily the thing that I, I think are, are, are the right ones. And I also, after all these years of not having an album out to put something out new out, I, I, I you know, whatever label it comes out on, I want them to get behind it. And, and and some yeah. labels, you know, are very much a case, a case of saying, well, look, you know, we'll distribute it and all the rest of it, but, you know, you guys have really got to push it. And it's like, well, you know, why would I even, you know, you're not even a label then. I mean, anyone can get, phys yeah, you know, yeah. physical, you can get the physical products in the physical shops and the digital products in the digital shops without too much effort. Um, yeah. You know, so we could just have a distribution deal and put it out ourselves in that case, mm -hmm. which I don't, which again, I don't want to do because that is just... All of a sudden, you're just fucking setting up businesses, aren't you, all over the place? And you know, yeah. if I wanted to work at work at a record company, I'd work at a record company. I wouldn't fucking set one up. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, and that's one one thing I will say about Eric is they they were really good with us. So I think we had like a, a good understanding. Like if they had suggestions or ideas, we'd take them on board and vice versa. And they they promote the albums really well, you know. Yeah. Um, but. You know, a lot of people give them bad rep and they'll do great with us. So. Yeah, um, it's it, it, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, I've I, over the years I've heard all sorts about earache, and um, but you know, like I said, you can you can only speak as you find, and if you've, they've done all right by you, then then they've done all right by you. That's the main thing. Yeah, so when you know it's uh, no, you shouldn't speak to them. They're dickheads. Well, it's fine with me. So <laughs> <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, cool. Uh, well, I mean, hopefully, hopefully one day we'll actually do a fucking gig together. I mean, bearing in mind that we've got the same agent, um, you know. Yeah, that would be brilliant. That'd be great. Wouldn't it just? And I think, I, I think, yeah. it, I think it'd be great because we get, it's like, you know, despite the fact that we're both rash bands, I think we'd also both find ourselves expanding our audience because, you know, 
the old school are going to turn up to see us, the new school are going to turn up to see you, and then there is some sort of considerably more broad-minded people in the middle who yeah. want to see both bands and have already seen both bands. Yeah, I think it would be really good. It would be good to see like a, a UK run. Yeah. Um, you know, from top to bottom, that's great. Yeah, yeah, big time. It'd be fucking awesome, man. It really would. Really would. Can I ask you, you know the album The Fear? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the producer, Uncle Bastard. Yeah. Who, who is Uncle Bastard? Right, Uncle Bastard <laughs> is, um, is a guy called Frank Meisen, M-I-Z-E-N. And right. he, at the time, was a trombone player for a, com- for a band called Zoot and the Roots, who were a huge band up north. Um, right. And he was just well known as being a... He, he was just a really wacky guy. And um, and I um, and yeah, he was suggested as a producer. We said, "Oh, you know, these guys suggested him." And um, we walked we walked in and we met him. And um, and then I remembered like talking just about talking about crediting the album. And he went, "Just call me Uncle Bastard." <laughs> and I was like, "Right, uh, okay, fine, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah." Right. So so he did Moschenstein, he did the Fear, and he did um, he did the the Hanging on the Telephone Ten Inch. Um, and um and yeah he's he's we're friends on facebook we i still have the odd uh, have the odd chat with him he's still involved in music um and his his son has set up a venue in Harrogate which is rocking by all accounts um oh, so um so yeah he's he's still involved he also went on to produce the debut album by Scottish thrash metal band um uh oh, what they call drunken state um and the, oh. The, the the debut album Kilt by Death, <laughs> and that was that, and he he produced it, and that was recorded in Harrogate as well. Oh, brilliant! Um, well, I know that now. <laughs> yes, yes, you know you know that now. Is that a, is that a question that has always been, that you've always been wanting to ask? Yeah, for I just some always wonder, like, who, I thought it was like a you know someone really famous. It was like <laughs> a cover. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was somebody really famous who didn't want to be credited on an acid radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who, can, who can blame them? Um, but um, so, what's the scene up there like? Uh, like these days? Um, not that. Um, that not that. Uh, you know, a man with young kids, two jobs, and a band would <laughs> would would have too much time for the scene. But um, uh, you know, any any ideas? Um, I've been to a few gigs. Um... It's mainly Manchester because that's where I, I am, and the Rebellion in Manchester is a really good venue to play. I know because we've played like, it. We've played it two or three times. Where the fuck were you? It's brilliant, isn't it? Oh well, then. <laughs> 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 I need to know like on the day, and then I can go. Like, if I plan anything, it just goes to shit. <laughs> well, I, I I've got first hand experience of that. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I know where you're coming from. Yeah, uh, yeah, Manchester's really good. A lot of people turn up for gigs. Um, yeah. I just went to the um, Slayer and Lamb of God thing yeah. at the arena, and that was just, it was full. It was fuller than it was for Metallica. And, I, you know, I couldn't believe how many people there. I know Slayer are huge, but I just, you know, it was like a step back, like, whoa, they filled this arena. Yeah. That's, you know, that's massive. Well, I love Slayer. I mean, Wembley was virtually sold out. It was fucking huge. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, same here. Absolutely, fucking worship Slayer. Um, I I worked out. I've seen them every two years since I was seventeen. Um, Brilliant. Which is just, I mean, it was weird afterwards, mate. It was such a weird well, feeling. What, thinking, what's the best you've seen them? Um, I would have to say probably um, performing Rain in Blood in its entirety. And I saw them do that twice a year apart, both at the same venue, which was the old London Astoria. Um, wow. And that had a special vibe, the Astoria. Um, and watching them deliver Rain in Blood from start to finish, yeah, those two shows really fucking stand out. Oh, I bet. 
Oh. That, that album's perfect for me. It's just one long perfect song for me. <laughs> it, it is. Well, I, do, I mean, I've, I've done a number of Slayer specials on the podcast I've done, and, and, like, you know, get various authors like Joel McIver and DX Ferris and yeah. various people with lots of knowledge about Slayer and we just, like, have a chat. And I did a retirement special for Slayer, but I also did a, um, a, a special um, episode on Rain in Blood as well. Um, and, I mean, it's probably... It is probably my number one favorite album with right very hard on its on it on its heels um would be master of puppets i would, I would have thought yeah i'm I'm pretty much the same really blood if, if I had to pick one album to be on a desert island, it would probably be rain in blood just uh, I have it in my car and I judge my distances by numbers of raining bloods, so if I'm driving <laughs> to this I know that that's one and a half raining bloods. <laughs> so you've come up with a whole new way of measuring time and distance yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's like how, how how far away is it eh, it's about one and a half raining bloods yeah well, I know what that means so yeah love it here. yeah 45 <laughs> minutes probably about yeah. 40 miles if the traffic's all right <laughs> yeah oh, that's, that's brilliant that's brilliant no I mean for me yeah uh, raining blood it just kind of changed everything really um, and and whilst Ma- Master of Puppets is a is a worker genius and is not far behind Rain in Blood, um, yeah. there's just something there's just something fucking primeval about about Rain in Blood about just the 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 um, just the nature of it the fact that it's just never quits that it's just fucking yeah, it's, it's on you all the time. It's just visceral. It's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, and and also the 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 expand well expanded remastered edition with um, with aggressive perfector on as well, which is a fucking ripping version. Oh yeah, yeah, that's the one that's in my car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's there's the um, Dave's Dave's fucking double roll on his snare um, at the end of the first verse, or at the end of the first verse chorus, and then it kind of pauses and the riffs open. And then oh, they come yeah. back in, and he's just got a, he's got a double snare roll there that is just fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Um And but I, but I'm I'm a fan of the Bostaff era as well though. Um, I mean, Bostaff is so good, isn't he? But I, I know I noticed that this, the last gig. I mean, a lot of the time, I think some drummers try to follow the band, and then the band try and follow the drummer. But Bostaff was not moving for anyone. And his tempo, and he was like, "No, this is how fast the song is." Yeah, you know, you can hear like guitars now and then, like going a bit forward or back. And he was like, "No, this is it. <laughs> you stick to it." Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, I, it was. I mean, they were flawless at Wembley. Absolutely flawless. Yeah. How was it? How was Manchester for you? Oh, they, they were perfect. You know, bits here and there, but I think that's with, with any metal gig, it's never going to be hundred percent. But even the bits that were a bit missed. I didn't care, you know, Slayer. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to see them again. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So are you, a, are you a Lamb of God fan? No. no I, I tried them. I, I, that is the right I answer. Them, you know. <laughs> I watched them, and like, my, I wouldn't say they're crap. I wouldn't buy like, ever badmouth them, but for me, oh, I would. you've got to have riffs. <laughs> Yeah. You've got no riffs, and I, yeah. I just don't remember anything about the set. I don't remember a riff that was like, oh, riff. Yeah. It was just, it's, that's E, and there's a really good beat to it. Yeah. And I just, I just wasn't a fan of it. I, I respect what they do, and, you know, they're huge, but it just didn't hit me. Yeah, no, and, and for me, um, you know, bless him. I like, I like Randy Blythe. I like his interviews. I like his, um, yeah. I like his photography. Um, um, and I even don't mind him as a front man. But it's just that voice. It's just bring. Just did nothing for me at all. Never has. And um, just yeah, I, 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 it's just it's one of those one of those bands where you know you know where you just hold your hands up and go, I just don't get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's my problem. I, I I don't get it. Yeah. There's no risk there. There's no hook that's like for me. Like I'll remember that. Yeah. You know, if you watch Slayer, you're like, oh, that riff is the best riff they've ever written. But I didn't have any of that for their set, you know. Yeah, no. Well, but for me, for me as well, I don't know. I, I I struggle to pick out song structures in in Lamb of God, and I and I think and again, I think it's because 
I'm never quite sure which riff is which because it, it just no, no, <laughs> nothing seems to stand out for me to be able to fucking get me, you know, to hang on to, you know. I, um, I do appreciate the, the drumming, like the, the drummer, like Chris Adler is an amazing drummer. Although he wasn't but, playing that night. No, he wasn't playing, no. Yeah. But I think he was trying to play as well as he could, as what Chris Adler had played, but, you know, it's technical stuff, but if you've got no riffs, I'm just not that interested. Yes, yeah. I mean, you know, it, 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 yeah. That there's, there's. I, I, yeah. It's well, it's all about riffs. Funnily enough, we're, um, you know, working on the new album at the moment, and um, we're just at a mixing stage. And I was just chatting mm. with the producer, and he was saying, "Well, you know, I don't, you know, we were just talking about guitar tones and stuff like that." Um, and I just said to him, "Look, you know, this is thrash metal. Um, the guitar tone." is as far as I'm concerned the most important part of the production yeah. it's it's Definitely. it's like forget everything if it's thrash metal it's guitars first and everything else comes second you can get away with yeah. an average vocal sound an average drum sound no bass sound ask Metallica um, <laughs> do you know what I mean you can get away with with average of all the other things if you've got a bitching guitar sound yeah true you know um, I think the, the, the guitar in the guitar in thrash is the vocal in pop. It's yeah, that people hear and focus on. I mean, yeah, like James Hetfield, he's great singer, great lyrics and everything. But you, you listen to the guitar first, the riff. It's like a bonus to have the vocal there. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's it's. I mean, it's what grabs you. I mean, fucking hell. First time I ever listened to um, to uh, SOD, Speak English or Die, you know, yeah. Sergeant D comes in and it's just like, fucking hell. <laughs> you know, first time I heard it, I just thought, wow. And I mean, and, if, and funnily enough, having said what I said about the production, there you go. There's, a, there, there's an album with an absolutely amazing guitar sound and everything else is really fucking average. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but everyone still goes... Wow, the production on that album. Well, not really. It's a production on those guitars, and that's about it, really. Yeah, true. But um, no, it is. It is, and well, it's it's the foundation that everything else hangs off. You know, and I think sonically, it it is just so important. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's because our fourth album score. If you listen to the guitars on that, that's leading up to that one. We found like that's the sound we've wanted right and going from there i'm not sure what we'll do <laughs> hopefully we get it again but I don't know. <laughs> what you mean you mean fleming rasmussen didn't get it down first time <laughs> that, um, well we, we didn't do what we were doing so yeah you know, we're just like this is this is us uh hi <laughs> i mean, I'm not, I've, i i know i know you're probably sick of talking about it but um if you can remember back in the fog of time what was um what was it like working with him it was really good, you know. He, he um, we initially joked with the earache, like you know, they were like, "Oh, you know, we think you could be like a really important band in the trash scene, blah blah." And we joked, "Oh, let's let's get Fleming and like get the Metallica tick there." Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, someone emailed him, I can't remember who, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll do it." I'm like, oh, uh, oh, okay. And we next thing we knew, we, we were in Denmark his studio recording on the same desk that Lightning and Puppets was recorded on. That's... And with all these gold discs on the wall, just, what's, what's going on? It's just all kind of blurred now, but it was great. He came over for like pre-production in England. He came to a rehearsal room and just listened to us play the songs. And for some reason, he was humping the guitar cab as we were doing them. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and yeah, really nice guy. Um, he like Russ is different in the fact that he will he will produce to hell. He will suggest like don't do that. You should do this. This sounds crap. This sounds good. Fleming was just like a kind of a vibe guy. Where if we do something, he's like, oh, I like that. Yeah, cool. Let's record that. And you know he, he didn't go beyond that, which is which is fine. Cause it worked out great. Yeah. But um, he's, he's a lot less hands on. He, he just lets the band do what they want to do. Well, um, which, which Ross is that you're referring to? Oh, Russ Russell, sorry. Sorry, Russ, not Ross. Oh, I yeah. know. Yeah, I know Russ. Yeah. Yeah, Russ Sound. 
Well, we were, he was he was he was up for doing this album, but um, uh, yeah, schedules and all the rest of it, so uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it didn't happen. But yeah, no, he's um, he's a sound bloke, is Russ. I mean, I've only worked with him once. I did some, I did a guest vocal, funnily enough, on a version of Goddess um, that uh, Cerebral Scar were doing. So I came in to do some oh, like right. some co-vocals on it. Um, and that's the only that's the only time we met, but it was it was just a really good laugh, really really easy session, and really just really good fun to do. Um, but he know he knows his shit, doesn't he? Yeah, it's kind of scary um, that we we record we record the song, or you know, it gets finished, and then it's say uh, like, right, you guys fuck off for the day, just go into town, do whatever you want. Like, okay. And then we come back in the early evening. And then he'd go, right, come here, and he'd press play. And it, it would be like a completely different song and sound. And we was like, what the hell have you done? That sounds amazing. He was like, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a magician. He's, he's really good. So, so what, he would he'd like move sections around and stuff? And, no, no, not structurally, but it would just it'd make it sound so better not just like producing wise or yeah. mixing wise he just done something that we were all like this was not what we recorded earlier it is what we recorded but he'd done something it sounds amazing so he's, he's, he's a magician that's and uh, i mean hopefully you'll um you'll get a chance to work with him again yeah well we don't know what we're doing yet because um you know we've, we've done three albums with russ and i'd happily do it again but i, I i've always thought you know, it's always good to try different things. But if we do end up using this again, that's that's fine. I'd be happy. But I've always thought about, you know, maybe someone else might bring something that we've not even thought of or tried. So, yeah. I don't know. We're not even thinking about producer at the moment. We're just, you know, throwing around ideas. I know what you mean because we've we've en- we've gone back to Jace Lewis, who we did a very um, uh, we had a very very. Um, uh, difficult session recording the last single, the man who became himself, not through Jace's mm. doing, through somebody else's doing. Um, right. But but we really enjoyed working with him, and we just like the idea of a guy who can get massive sounds, but also his, you know, his music is is electronica to a certain extent. You know, it's kind of like right. it's sort of like Fear Factory, Ramstein, and Depeche Mode all put in a blender. Um, mm. And uh, and I mean he's he's really big in his own right, you know. I mean he's worked with Queen, he's worked with all sorts of different musicians, um, wow. and and I just really like the idea of bringing somebody in whose whose roots aren't in metal. He understands metal. He was a you know a teenage huge Sepultura and Fear Factory fan and all the rest of it, but mm. it was just just somebody who works completely differently in the studio. So especially with me doing vocals. You know, he's making all sorts of suggestions to me, which sometimes, I, you know, most of the time I would say yes and sometimes I would say no. And then and then we try something or try something different. But also in the production of the vocals and everything else, he um, he brings kind of like dance tricks to it that, yeah. you know, and little, little, little effects that nobody will notice other than me, um, mm. but just make you know, that just have such a great impact and just, I just kind of lift the boy, the voice above everything else and stuff. And it was, yeah, it was just, it was a classic example of working with somebody who does bring something really different to the table, you know? Yeah, a standard, no, I don't mean standard, but a normal metal producer wouldn't even think of stuff like that. So I, I yeah. think that's why it's good to maybe try someone else, you know, but who knows? Well, I think, um, I think when you, when you're, when you're learning your way, when you're finding your way, as you are, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, up until your third album, you, you've, you, you're still kind of finding out who you are. And then yeah, from true. third and fourth album onwards, you're kind of like, well, we know who we are. Now we want, the get, now we want to get the best version of ourselves. Yeah. Um, and once you've done that on album three and album four, then it's right now we want to get the best version of ourselves but also we want somebody to come in and make the best version of ourselves even better with ideas that yeah. we ain't just going to have yeah you know I, I think that's what Metallica did on the, the Bob Rock thing you know going from Justice to the Black Album I know, I know a lot of people don't like it but he did some good things for them I think 
Well, yeah, one of the biggest selling albums of all time. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it works, out, works yeah. out all right, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but the, oh, um, the thing is that, uh, well, yeah, and I, I mean, I... I I, I I prefer the I prefer the production on the Black album than I do to uh, and Justice for All. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I do love Justice, but you know it's very, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, I I like Justice mainly because what we were talking about earlier, the guitar tone. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it is fucking unbelievable. But it's so it's unbelievable. Mix, yeah. But it's so unbelievable. <laughs> there's no room for the fucking bass. Yeah. So. Well, the same that. Well, I, I do, I do think they should have been there, but because I'm so familiar with Justice, there's the, someone mixed it from the Guitar Hero thing with Jason's bass on, and I didn't like it because it didn't sound right with a bass. <laughs> yeah. Like no, no, just, just guitars and drums. That's fine. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I would love to have heard um, Rob Trujillo re-record the bass parts to that to that album and then stick it on. Yeah, yeah, he was very good. Yeah. Well, Bertie's and guitarist is the flamenco guy as well, isn't he? Yeah, he's just he's just all round talented musician. Um, yeah. And um, I I met him once in fuck me 1988. We supported suicidal tendencies. Um, oh wow! In at Brixton Academy, um, and he was in suicidals. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, just top man. You know, well they were all like just really chilled out and really cool. Um, and he seems like a nice guy. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, but most people are in a world of metal, aren't they? It's very rare that, yeah. you, that you meet an absolute fucking knob, unless you play with mayhem. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, I never have, but yeah, yeah I, 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 I did in twenty seventeen. Um, and it's weird; it permeates everybody who works for them. Even their road crew are absolute fucking cocks. Um, wow! Yeah, I know. It was just, it was, it was just quite a thing to behold, really. You know, we're all like, you know, in, in, a day at a festival, and you're in the kitchen, and everybody's getting their food, and there was like three or four of us just stood round eating, and this guy's like, "Why are you? Why are you all stood there? You are in my way." I'm like, <laughs> "Right, okay, fucking okay. hell, yeah." It's one of those. Wow. It's one of those situations that I look back on, and I'm just really, really annoyed that I didn't like. Because everybody, I think, in situations like that, when somebody is like an outstanding dick, it, 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 you, it kind of, I don't know. You're almost in shock for a little bit. Yeah, you think later. Oh, I should have said that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You, you do. You yeah. think. You think I, I actually let them get away with that. You know, I can't, I can't yeah. believe I let that person get away with it. But at the time, I, you, you're just kind of dumbfounded. I think, I think in metal, 99.5% of people are just nice and you get along with them. But there are the few that you meet and just think, oh, God, go away. Yeah. Go up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, but, I mean, having said that, I mean, you know, the... Um, the average breakdown with the with the the general public is, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it, the people being nice is a lot less than ninety nine point five percent. That's for sure. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, I I think we're doing all right. I think we're doing all right. So um, so when did you guys play Bloodstock? Oh, um, we've played from two thousand six every two years until two thousand twelve, I think. Well, 2006 is where Eric saw us and um, wanted to sign us from that. And then just every two years, because we can't play every year, just asked us back. So hopefully we can get back again soon. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. do you, do you get to the festival if you're not playing? Yeah, I've been a few times, but um, last year I couldn't go because um, our daughter was, she was only born in July. And so she'd have been a month old and, you know, we just wanted to, Spend time with her this time round. Again, I just can't plan really well at the moment. Yeah, and um, and so were you there in twenty sixteen then? Who played? Uh, Mastodon headlined Saturday night. Um, and Gajira were on as well. No, no, I didn't. I watched on the stream though, but no, I didn't make it to that one. I haven't made it a lot since not being evil. 
just because yeah. I'm, I'm not in that band mindset, you know, I'm just home getting things done here, you know. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. And how's your um, how's your other half with um, with you sort of going back to the band? She's fine. Like it, the whole time I was not in the band, she she wanted me to be in the band. She was like, you know, I mean, I, I want to see her. Like when when we in, initially got together, it wasn't long after that that I decided I didn't want to, want to do it anymore. So she was like, I only got to see you once. So now I'm back in the band. She's actually happy that she gets to see me play again. Well, that, that's that's a that's a story that you don't hear very often in the music business. No, no, no. <laughs> she's she's quite supportive actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, so, do you, have you got any other sort of pastimes or hobby? You into any sports? Huddersfield Town, etc. Uh, no, I, I used to be into football when I was younger, but then music kind of took over. But other than that, I just you know see friends, um, video games now and then. Just watch a lot of films. And just chill out, really. And got to that point where I'd rather stay in and watch a film than go out and get smashed. <laughs> yep, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So, were, were you ever tempted to do a, a follow-up solo album? Well, I was. I was um, in the process of writing it around the time of before joining Evil again, and I'd written some starts of songs, but I was so used to writing Evil stuff that. When it got to that point where I don't know what to do next, I couldn't do anything. And I thought, I, I don't know what to do because, you know, I haven't got Matt to bounce off or a, a jam room or anything. So a few of the riffs that I'd started, I said to Eva, like, you know, some of this is quite Eva-ly and do you reckon we could do these as Eva songs? I said, yeah, sure. As soon as I said that, I thought of 50 fucking ideas for them riffs. <laughs> like as soon as the, as soon as the email songs, I've got ideas for them. But if the solo songs, I haven't got anything. <laughs> <laughs> Makes no sense. Hey, uh, I'm getting the feeling that basically that's the only band you could ever be in. Yeah, it's all I've, it's all I can do. Yeah. You know, well, I, I cook, can't do anything. Mate, <laughs> like mate I'm, I'm, I'm exactly the same. There is, there is no other band that 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 I can that I can do that I can be in other than Acid Rain. Um, yeah, <laughs> and um, I mean, I, I was in a little. I was in something that never really took off called Strange Thing um, mm. years ago when I lived in Newcastle. But yeah, it's um, there's yeah, there's just I don't know. It's it's home. You know what I mean? Yeah, nothing else. I, I just thought, right, I know what I'm doing now. I'm okay. I can do it. <laughs> and so well, I, I tried writing a few things for um, a few people in bands that like well-known bands that we thought, oh, maybe we could do like a, you know, a side project. And I'd, I'd write a few riffs, but I, I didn't really know what I was doing because it felt like I can't write their music because I, I could only write mine. And I just never really did anything, you know. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I've done a few guest appearances here and there, but they just want me to come along and sound like me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. It, it, So it's kind of cheating, really. Um, yeah, I don't know if you get solos. It's like, oh, I can play solo. So, yeah, but it'll just be like standard what I sound like. <laughs> That's all you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um. But, you know, I guess I guess that's, you know, that's, that, that, that's what people want, ultimately. Um, so when, yeah. you, when you guys first got signed, um, I mean, you've... you've You've kind of seen you were you were really early doors on the on the second wave of thrash, haven't you? You've really seen it. You've really kind of ridden that wave. Say again. Just from the 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 second Sorry, wave. You, you cut it out a bit here. Do you want to bring me back? All oh, right, hang on a sec. How's that? Yeah. All right. How's that? Yeah, I can hear you now. All right, cool. Um, cool. Yeah, you you guys were so when you when you first broke, you were you were right at the right time as regards the second wave of thrash and you've really sort of kind of sort of ridden that you must have seen you must have seen that like that scene kind of just reappear and and just get bigger and bigger yeah it, it was it was interesting because when when we started doing gigs we were just doing like we were called Mel Militia and we were doing the Tiger songs and then we started writing our own stuff <clears throat> and putting it into the set like you know oh, that was Metallica, but now this is one of ours, and people have been like, oh, God. And no one took it seriously. Like, every gig we've played, everyone wanted to hear Metallica. And then we play one of our songs, and they're like, why are you writing thrash? You know, that's, it's 80s. It's 80s music. Like, no one is going to give a shit. And they were right. For a while, we just 
we got to be trying. We're like, oh, God, this is any marathon. <laughs> but, you know, it just, something happened at some point where people started taking Thrash a bit seriously again. And we just happened to be just getting signed and doing an album at the time when, you know, Municipal Waste were really taking off as well. I think they were way before us. But then, you know, it just happened at the same time. It just went boom, you know. I know. It's, 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 it's weird because it's just, you know, all of a sudden it, it started coming back and... You know, there, there was a there was a period there where it was just literally like you know one band reforming a week that you know that you that you yeah. heard of, um, which is you know which is a bit rich coming from you know coming from me and given what we're doing, <laughs> you know, but uh, but fuck it, that's a reboot, not a reformation. As yeah, I keep, no, as, you're allowed. You're as, allowed. As, as I keep telling people, <laughs> as I keep telling people. Well, look, mate, um, I've got I've got some questions for um, for um, Patreon subscribers, so I've just finished the, the the main interview there, and then I've got some sort oh, of. Wait, some... We've, we've not talked about films yet. Oh, don't worry, <laughs> uh, don't worry. I've, okay. I've got all of that lined up. Hang on a sec. Oh, good. And what a top chap he is, eh? Um, and how kind of him to uh, to uh, reference the uh, the movie podcast coming soon on the end. There, um, we haven't had our we haven't had our movie catch up yet, but we uh, we will be having one. Um, so yeah, what a cool guy. I mean, I really hope we um, I really do hope we uh, we end up doing some shows with them at some point. Um, it really would be good to get the the UK. Um, uh, old old school thrashers and new school thrashers all in a room together, and I think um, I think we we could be the bands to do it, or should be the bands to do it. I really really would like to um, to do some shows with them, but uh, that's uh, that's that's another thing altogether. And also, as you heard, um, he had questions to answer for wonderful Patreon listeners. Sorry, I keep going on about it. Mm. Sorry, I'm, I'm really thirsty today, so my apologies for all the uh, all the drinking and stuff, but that's just the way it is. Um, so anyway, where were we? Um, ah, yes, I was looking at. Um, uh, I, I mean, this this headline absolutely just blew me away. Here we go. Papa Roach hits milestone with two billion streams. Um, two billion streams. This is fucking. I mean, you know, I'll regularly take the piss out of um, uh, out out of uh, Jacoby Shaddix as I have before. Um, again, like I said, though I've said, I've heard some really you know good things about him. The bands were presented with the band was presented with a plaque on Thursday, the last of their three night run at the Roxy in Los Angeles to celebrate the release of its new album. Who do you trust? We're thrilled to be Pandora billionaires. Yeah, exactly. It means so much that our fans support us through the years and that Pandora gives them the opportunity to stream how they want. Thanks to the fans and thanks to Pandora. Big thumbs up from Papa Roach. So, yeah, but, I mean, you don't get anything for it, obviously. But, yeah, that's that's phenomenal. There is clearly... I mean, I've, I've, I've said this before, I'll say it again. When you're part of a scene and that scene goes down... You go down with it. I mean, obviously referring to Acid Rain going down with the down with the ship with the with the thrash scene, but invariably the originals, um, the scene will still maintain them. So you know the originals of thrash, um, they were able to to keep going. The originals of new metal, you know, Corn, Deftones, Slipknot, Corn, and whatever, you know, um, and add into that Papa Roach. They they're they're all still going. It's the it's the second tier numpties that. Uh, like like acid rain and bands like that 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 really kind of go by the wayside um, when a when a scene goes under and that is just that, that that's just par for the course you know that's just the way it is but that is phenomenal for a band that I literally like just laugh at and piss on and think of nothing uh, I'm so out of touch that they're doing that. Um, and from one to the other, let's go from that to Judas Priest performs Killing Machine title track live for the first time since 1978. I just know Sneepy has got to be behind that. He's got to, he's got to be sticking his oar in there going, come on, we haven't played this, you know, you haven't played this for years. It, it's now's the time. Let's let's get out there. Let's play some, you know, play some new songs. I'm sure. What well, some new songs? Some old songs. Some stuff we haven't played before. I'm sure Sneep will be involved in in some form of that. Um, Ozzy's illnesses continue. Fucking hell! It was the manky finger 
Now, flu forces postponement of first UK tour dates. Well, does it? You know, does it? That's 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 my question, because flu basically um, is a hospital job. So um, Ozzy Osbourne, Judas Priest, have been uh, postponed due to Ozzy having a very bad case of flu. The concerts in Dublin, January 30th, Nottingham, February 1st, Manchester, February 3rd, Newcastle, February 5th, will be rescheduled at a later date. Details will follow. I mean, he's moving stuff around all over the place. Hello, Sharon, calm down. He can't do it anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just... It's it's an, another postponement, and all I'm saying is, especially at Aussie's age, flu, that's, you know, that's a killer. He's a seventy year old man. He he would be in a hospital if he if he's had flu. That's all I'm saying. He'd be in hospital. He wouldn't just be cancelling a few dates. But um, you know, such is life. Um, I'm not going to do any more updates on the whole. Um, uh, um, anthrax, uh, well, and Frank Bello and uh, Dave Lefson thing, because um, it just I, it, it's it's not really thrash. Like I said, it, it, it is more um, it's more um, well. I think I said before, Foo Fighters than anything else. Um, yeah, it just uh, it, it just does my it just does my head in. It's it's yeah, it's it's kind of not what you want from those guys. So you know, so don't go there. Um, but yeah, I just, yeah, just meh. Um, and uh, one thing I did see, which uh, I am a huge fan of the uh, first Dave Lee Roth album, uh, Eat and Smile. Um, I love that album. For me, that is just the sound of fucking sunshine. It really is. It's, it's just something about that album. There's some great grooves on it, some great songs. Um, it's just awesome. It's the best, you know, as they, they said, as they said at the time when it came out, it's the best... It's the best album Van Halen never made. It's absolutely brilliant. I love it. Um, And, um, uh, you know, yeah, even when I was, like, deep into thrash, I was still getting that that album was just awesome. And and the band reunited without Dave Lee Roth, funnily enough. Um, uh, Greg Bissonette, Steve Vai and Billy Sheehan. I mean, Steve Vai and Billy Sheehan, they're playing on that album is phenomenal it really is to hear a bass and a guitar going at it like it does is amazing and um and they played um that, that well so greg bissonette um sheehan and uh vi teamed up um were joined by uh jeff scott soso um and did a couple of uh and did a couple of um songs from, the, from that first um, Davey Roth album and I wish I could have been there because I, I honestly I'm I am a big fan of that album and it is so not thrash so fucking what lots of stuff isn't thrash and it's still good anyway I'm rambling here I'm fucking rambling I'm sorry occasionally that is going to happen I am going to ramble I'm in a funny kind of mood to be honest I mean if I'm really honest I am in a funny kind of mood um, it's, it's sort of twilight at the moment um, you know, it's um, twilight, or is it sort of otherwise known magic hour? Now, um, uh, and yeah, I don't know. It's just I'm a bit, ooh, a bit all over the place. A bit kind of, oh, a little bit whoa, a little bit way. You know, uh, let's. I'll tell you what. Why don't I stick another interview on and see if I can fucking sort my head out? Um, right. So, folks, um, you've seen all of the noise re-releases coming out on BMG. They're fucking awesome. The man speaks to him about them. Who's been doing them? Is the one and only second time on the show, Miles Hackett. Last time we spoke to him, he was running his hardcore label, um, uh, Dry Heave, who put out Acid Rain, Planet of the Damned on 7-inch, which was very kind of him. Um, and now, he the main man at BMG, bro. So, let's hear how it all came about and what else he's got up his sleeve. This is me and Miles talking a few weeks ago. Hello. Hello there. Morning, how are you? I'm very well. How are you, mate? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. I had a chilled night in and just been playing some NDC. <laughs> oh, you are, yeah. Old school. <laughs> I know, you are, you are just the, the most hardcore person I know, I think. <laughs> like, Saturday I know, Saturday morning, bad. bit of MDC, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be done. You know, we, had, we started with this part of the morning with 
white snake, so I had to address the balance. Oh God, that's no. Yeah. That, you don't want to start anything with white snake, especially a morning. <laughs> yes, you put it on when I was in the bath. Uh, oh, that, that's, you, that's that's cheating. That is that is officially <laughs> cheating. Taking control of <laughs> taking control of the stereo whilst you're in the bath. That's. I know, I know. It's a bit of a you know, it's a bit of a. a undercut moves but uh, so I've retrieved it and uh, it's going to be I think we're going to work up, work up towards some grind call well yeah yeah and then some rela- <laughs> and then and then some relationship counselling soon after <laughs> <laughs> I'm inspired because I went to see that film the other night that played to the grind um, part of the dock and roll thing it's a movie about ground car it's really interesting actually repulsion napalm death obviously carcass that kind of stuff yeah yeah it's really good oh right okay well I'll have to check that out um, yeah. And uh, and thank you for the CDs, by the way. Very much appreciated. Uh, more than welcome. More than welcome. Is there anything else you'd like? Give me a shout. Well, I, th- I well, I, yeah, definitely. Terrible certainty, because uh, that yep. is that is one of my favourite. Cre- In fact, definitely terrible certainty, and definitely um, uh, oh, f- pleasure to kill. Because I think I I got the I got the remastered pleasure to kill, but it was the one that was remastered a long time ago. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. These are. These are supposed to be the definitive versions. So, uh, yeah, they're all expanded out to double CDs. I think they've got, like, live sets and stuff on them as well. And um, there's some EPs. I think Terrible Certainty might have out of dark on it. And, uh, and, uh, and presumably uh, Flag of Hate is on... Flag of Hate, yeah. yeah. No, those two would be awesome. Because I did, I did buy um, Extreme Aggressions, um, which, is a, which is a lovely package. And I also bought Killing Technology and Dimension Hatros as well. Oh, cool! On CD, so you got the DVD versions as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. I got the got yeah. the full on got the full on versions. Um, nice. Which, yeah, nice. Although I didn't know you were working there at the time. Fucking hell! I could have saved myself some money. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. Those ones were kind of um, they were already kind of in manufacture when I started, but I, I did all the marketing on them and stuff, and had to deal with the bands, and that it was cool. Yeah, I'm immensely proud of working on all that stuff. Well, that that yeah, so okay, so just uh, that's a that's a good sort of way into to what we we're going to talk about. So, how did uh, uh, you know at what stage in what stage of the lifetime of these um, uh, re-releases did you sort of get on board? Well, um, as you know, I was doing my own DIY label because we released an acid rain seven inch, and then Absolutely. a very good friend of mine was working at BMG and um, in the catalog department, and. The, he was posting up on Facebook, you know, looking for a label manager, and I was out in the pub with him, and I was like, what's this job you're advertising? And he was like, oh, you should totally apply for it, you can totally do it. And I was like, okay, when I did a bit of research, I didn't know a whole lot about them, I knew that they were kind of a, a mini major coming up, you know. Um, and I looked, and they, they, owned, they bought the Sanctuary catalogue from Universal. And uh, that Sanctuary catalogue's got a lot of gold in it, one of them being Noise Records. Yeah. So I, I went down to the interview and I took a bunch of my records that I'd made and they were like, oh, you've got a vinyl, you know, pitch discs, you know, engraved records and all this stuff. And uh, there was like, so what are you interested in, you know, out of all the stuff that we know? And I was like, noise, it's my youth. And they were all looking at me going, really, you know about this stuff? I was like, oh, yeah, you know, this band's defined who I am today. So more interviews later and I got the gig and was thrown straight into running noise records, which was just like a dream come true, you know. That's, yeah, but that 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 whole that whole process there is more professional than the previous twenty five years history of that of noise records. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's got a bit of a checkered past. I mean, um, if you read that book, uh, "Damn the Machine," um, I've actually had um, uh, I actually had the uh, the the writer on the podcast. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, David. Yeah, so yes, he was kind of in David touch with us. G- David Gielke. Yeah. That's the guy, yeah. Yeah, he's like an American journalist. Yeah, I mean, I speak to him now and again because he's kind of interested in, in what's progressing with it, you know. I think the noise catalogue, well, I mean, the sort of catalogue story short, Carl Waterback sold it out in the late 90s, early 2000s, I want to say, to Sanctuary Group because I think he could see the digital wave coming. And, you know, after the sort of glory days of the 80s, he went to the States and he had a lot of sort of tried to be new metal and it kind of failed. And then he sort of went back to the power metal stuff where he did have some success. But I think he just became kind of disillusioned with it and sold out to Sanctuary. And Sanctuary, doing what they did, they were kind of like a reissue machine and they were pumping stuff out, particularly Halloween, got overexposed. And then Sanctuary went into bankruptcy and Universal bought it and it just kind of sat there for about five years doing nothing. Everything got kind of deleted. 
you know, with no relationships with any of the bands and then being keyboard it and was like, well, what is this label? And, you know, does anyone know anything about it? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so we kind of embarked on this um, reissue campaign. And some of these are just absolute classic albums, like, you know, the one you were saying, you know, yeah, Pleasure to Kill, Terrible Certainty. And there's a whole wave of new creative fans that never owned those. And, and I think BMG's kind of motto is um, we don't do anything without band involvement or band consent. So we've worked very closely with the artists on making kind of definitive versions. Even Tom G. Warrior, you know, just by him speaking out, I guess it's just, but we'll come to that. Yes, yeah, we, yeah, we, 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 we can get to that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's just been an interesting process. The first stuff we did was um, those four creative issues, and you probably saw the, the CD media books. Millet was very hands-on with it all. Um, yeah. He wanted to revisit the artwork, but kind of give it a bit of a makeover, but not kind of take it away from what it originally was. It's caused a bit of controversy because some fans hate change, but I get that. But um, at the end of the day, I think they look amazing and they sound incredible because we went back as far as we could. A lot of the tapes of that of his era stuff, the noise was a bit of a mess, to be honest. Yeah, no, no, no surprise there, mate. I mean, all our yeah. albums, all our, all our, all our albums are remastered from CD. Um, I remember, yeah. I remember trying to go looking for the masters, and uh, I think it was, I think it might have been Sony who owned it at the time before they flogged it all to Universal, and Sony were like, "What label were you on?" And I was like, "Under one flag," and they were, "Well, what, what?" What's that? And I was like, well, it was part of Music for Nations. Oh, Music for Nations, right. We were, we almost certainly haven't got your tapes, but we'll have a look. <laughs> yeah, they're in a skip somewhere, probably. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know where any of this stuff went. I believe as well that when Sanctuary went past, it was kind of like the last day of Rome and the place was looted. You know, so yeah. who knows where stuff went. There is bits and bobs kicking around, but I think as far as creating that, not. So... It's been a sort of painstaking process getting all the audio in and finding tracks because some only appeared on vinyl. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of track that did only appear on vinyl or on a Japanese edition. So we've been badly buying stuff in from Discogs and things like that because you know artwork and nothing. But uh, we created, they got involved, the, the guys, the team that do all their current artwork, they wanted to use it to work with those guys. So you know, it was kind of all controlled by Millet and, and them, so the vision of how the packaging went. And I think it's incredible. They've done an amazing job of them. Such yeah. detailed notes. Yeah. All this amazing memorabilia that he's dug out of the archive and he even allowed us to put the demos on there as well. Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, the the only having the Extreme Aggressions CD, but looking forward to the others arriving next week. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, it is a real, I mean, it's a great package. I mean, it's it, it's... You know the album sounds great. I mean, wait, it sounds fucking phenomenal. Yeah, um, but, it does. But I, but I always thought it sounded phenomenal at the time. But that when that album came out, I actually, I just totally bizarre. I actually reviewed it for Metal Hammer. Um, oh wow! Okay. I wrote the odd review for Metal Hammer back in the day. I don't know why. There you go. Um, but um, I remember, I remember thinking that this album is is going to upset a lot of people. And it was kind of like, it was just, it was on the verge of when Thrash just started to kind of become uh, com- a little bit more mer- mainstream, commercial. Bands yeah, were experimenting yeah. with, uh, uh, well, experimenting with songwriting instead of riff writing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they went out to the States and recorded out there, didn't they? And yeah. I think there was a bunch of producers they wanted to work with, but Noise obviously wouldn't stump up the money, so... And, and there was a whole controversy over the cover with that as well. It's funny because uh, Millet is under the impression that it's in an archive somewhere, the original cover. But um, no one's been able to locate it. I don't know if you ever see it. If you Google it, Extreme Impression Band cover, it's kind of like a demon head ripping out of someone's face, the, the creator demon. Oh, really? Yeah, you can find a kind of crude illustration of it. It's supposed to be an early working of it online. But in the end, the label, like, cause that was when they'd done this deal with... Um, EMI, I think, out in the States, or Epic or someone. And I was like, you can't put that on the front, and hence the photo. Ah, well, well, funnily enough, yeah, because I was reading, I think it's in the sleeve notes, or it's in the Damn the Machine book, where they actually started recording the album in Germany, and the band weren't happy, and Carl, for once, actually said, OK, fine, chuck all that away and start again Yeah. in, in, in the States, which was... Which was 
it's weird. He's, he's, it's, I've tried to get Carl on because there's, is there, there's like, when you look at decisions that he's made with bands and how he's handled them, with all of yeah. them, with all of them, there is all, there's all of a sudden a point where he does something that is like really fucking cool and yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And like, and, and like totally in tune with the band and you think, that's bizarre, you should have done more of that shit instead of <laughs> pissing everyone off most of the time. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting hearing, I mean, I've never met or spoken to him, but it's interesting hearing some of the feedback from the bands on this label that I've worked for, because I've had, like, for example, Death Row, you know, that they had a cover that they wanted to do, and he just came and said, no, we're using this. Yeah. <laughs> End off, you know, and I'm like, oh, right, okay. And the whole thing with their first album, I had two, two different covers and two territories, because they wanted Riders of Doom, and I think it was released in the States as Satan's Gift, because someone said, oh, you need to straighten it up a bit, you know, make it a bit more attractive to the metal. Sa- and look, they hated Sa- that cover. Satan it up a bit. That's, that's, the, that's my <laughs> phrase of the week. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It needs to be more evil. Satan's Gift, all right, man, I'm cross, you know, demon. They hated that cover. They didn't want it at all. <laughs> and then the second album was basically called Scattered by the Wind. But they ended up doing Raging Steel because they were like given that bitch and oh, well, we kind of fit for that song. Yeah. Fucking hell. So, Satan's gift. They, that, that is just classic. It's like, it's Satan, but he's in gift giving mood. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're not, not quite sure how evil that is. Well, I'll tell you what, I had a bit of a weird bump in the road with Death Row. It was, that was a bit of a sort of personal project to buy, and I had to sort of fight it internally to get it out because I was like, Death Who? You know. I've heard of okay, I've heard of this band, so I trust me, you know, it'd be all right. And it took quite a while to track the members down. And I ended up getting, like, via Milo on Facebook, he put me in touch with you, who was played on the last album, Deception Ignored. Yeah. He's like a big rave DJ now in Germany. And then he put me in touch with Sven, who was kind of like the main guy. And this guy, Sven, only picked his emails up in the library once a month. Um, so oh, it took right. about nine months to get the thing together to keep the sleeve notes but I think when he kept meeting up with his four bandmates all they do is get pissed and not do the interview <laughs> so uh, it kind of dragged on a bit but he sent me all this gold and all this unreleased recordings and stuff like that which was great but when we got it we got it out right and um, it went up on Spotify and all that for the first time ever and we managed to get the lyrics together and put them in the inner bag they'd never been released with the lyrics full lyrics before and there was one song I forget what it was I think it is Rise of Doom, actually. And if you read it, it's kind of like, all right, these 16-year-old kids from Germany, bear in mind, not writing in their first language. And it said some reference to, like, a Nazi death camp or something. But, you know, anyway, it got flagged by the German authorities, and we had to take it down from Spotify and draw it from South and Germany. Fuck. Of hate, hate speak. <laughs> wow. Which was, yeah, yeah, it really shocked me. Well, I, um, and unfortunately, I mean, that, that's not exactly something that you that you want to <laughs> create a press release out of and spread for the rest uh, of the no, world. No, I mean, I'm saying, like, hey, you lucky, you lucky. It's going to be public now, but you know. Yeah, you can't exactly yeah. put a press release out. Hey, you lucky fuckers in the rest of the world, you get the Nazi song. <laughs> but if you read it in context, it means absolutely nothing. Yeah, of course. It's just, it's just a string of words. Oh, how can we be evil? I think it's. Yeah. Nothing. Get what it was. I think it was the word like um, it was a name of. I was Auschwitz. It just had the word Auschwitz in it. Well, with 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 the greatest of respect to a lot of German thrash bands around at that time, who all were singing in English. Um, yeah. There was plenty of fucking pigeon lyrics out there that made very little sense. Of um, course, yeah. But just and, you know, not with the word. And these guys were no different when they were sixteen, you know, and trying to translate something into English, no doubt. So yeah. But they were cool guys, and they, we, I was particularly proud of those reissues because they gave us some great stuff. Well, I'm, and, uh, I, I was, I was particularly, I was particularly impressed by your, um, uh, by your Death Row T-shirt at the, um, at the spoken word that I did in in in, in London, and then, um, um, and that was that was how the the conversation started. I didn't realise you'd be involved with them because uh, Deception Ignored, I think, is. Is is a forgotten gem because it's almost by the time that came out, thrash was kind of on the slide already. Yeah. Um, and it was it, it a bit like I'm, I'm don't mean to drag acid rain into everything, but a bit like our last album, Obnoxious. It, it when it came out, it you were literally on the crest of a slump. 
Yes, you know, yeah, it, it was that early 90s when yeah. the peak had been, the peak was built there and it was like a few were surviving, but a lot of people were on the slide, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, well, I always, I always say, like, you know, we, 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 toured, we toured Obnoxious in April 1990 um, and to, to pretty much uh, three quarters to sold out venues every night. Yeah. And by the end of that year, we were playing to um, a quarter, a third full venues, if that. Right. You know, it was literally in that period in 90, it just, yeah, everything think, changed. Everything went death metal though, didn't it? It was all went up a year. Well, I unless, remember going well, to a lot well, of death metal shows in 1990. Well, unless you're Metallica, and again, this is where you've got to take your hat off to Lars and say, well, you know... They just as thrash fell apart, they stopped being a thrash band. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and went off and went off onto the road for two or three years, and literally just toured whilst grunge, grunge came and went. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They were quite resilient to it, I think. But yeah, I mean, that black, black album saved their ass, but didn't have anything like it since. No, no, but any anyway, yeah, fuck it. Um, fun, funnily enough, uh, little known fact. In fact, you know what? I should put this in my uh, spoken word show. Um, Carl from Noise rang me about two weeks before we were due to sign with Music for Nations. Oh right. Um, well, I'll be the deal. Yeah, yeah. We I I I sent him a demo along with everybody else, but they took um, they took six weeks to get back to me. Right. Um, and by which time we were, we'd already had the initial deal off um, Music for Nations and we were having it looked over by our lawyer. So, right. So I just said to him, look, you know, we signed this music. And he was like, oh, never mind. OK, it would, would have been great. You and Sabbath would have been good together. And, you know, that's fucking... Yeah. That's not how Carl sounds. That's just... That's my generic... That's my generic, <laughs> that's my generic German voice. Yeah, yeah. Generic German bloke speaking English. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but uh, so yeah, that it would that, that was that. But funnily enough, I remember I remember a few years later, Andy Sneap going, "Fucking hell, you've got no idea how lucky you were." Yeah, I was going to say to you, do you regret that decision? Probably not. Yes. Um, <laughs> but a lot of them were burned. But do you know but what the, the 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 one thing that Carl has in common is like, yeah, you know, a lot of labels. Uh, oh, sorry, a lot of bands on the label talk about how he fucked them over and those decisions and album sleeves and stuff like that. But um, it's funny, you know, when I talked to talk to Andy Sneap, he said, we knew that deal was shit when we signed it, but right. it was the only deal we were getting offered by anyone. And a lot of those, That's a lot of the ridiculous. bands that Carl signed said the same thing. Yeah. It's mental, isn't it, really? I think, I mean, there was a total enigma with it. I was, it was kind of, when I was young, noise was just like, you know, he just bought everything religiously. I used to pull those sleeves out and with the, mosaic of the covers and go dot dot need you know it yes. was like that it, yeah. was, it was you had to have them all yeah well and, yeah and I... it wasn't and it wasn't all trash you know no, we no. Find some of them. <laughs> well, well, looking at your looking at your looking at the um, the website of all the re-releases. Can I can I just say, on behalf of millions of metalheads around the world, uh, thanks for the running wild re-releases. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Oh, I bet they, they have, died. and I bet I bet I know where they've done very well. Germany. <laughs> they all charted in Germany. Yeah, I don't. I, that does not surprise me in the least. I mean, they were just one of those bands that never translated, but were huge in Germany. Yeah, they still. Are. I went over to Wacken this summer on a work jolly and had to meet up with Rolf, and he's very happy. And they were headlining it in front of like seventy thousand streaming fans. Yeah, it was funny. It was kind of like noise fest. I had Halloween playing one night and running well than the first. That that Bonkers. is awesome. Well, it, well, also um, Gravedigger. There's another band. All, yeah. You know, did something in Germany, but you know, nothing anywhere else really. Yeah, they've been coming over here a bit, and I think they're playing in January. They're kind of underworld size. They've sort of reached a bit of a cult status. Where Running Wild, I saw them at the Marquee in 1989 on their one and only ever London show. Wow. Um, they've never they've never been back. Ironically, this is like the sort of teenage kid and they took a load of photos and year, years later I got to use them in the artwork because they didn't provide any photos. Oh, that's <laughs> so brilliant. Go. That's brilliant. My own personal archive. Yeah, I mean, and that, that, that is... And the Death Row one as well. The Death Row one, they were taking it for them ground. 
to be when they came over, we've changed it. Well, this is this is awesome. I mean, this, if nothing else, proves that boy did they hire the, hire the right guy for the fucking job. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. there's no archive pictures of these bands anywhere. Don't worry, I've got some at home that I took myself. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm serious, yeah. I had a whole string of like the Detro again. I think they only did one UK show or maybe a couple. It was just actually ignored tour and they came over with Tanker and did the Greyhound. And I've got pictures of all of them from that show. I used to do it a lot and then I got a black eye somewhere and gave up stage diving, you know. Uh, the camera got well. smashed. That, but that, yeah, it just I've just had enough noise pictures to fill the gaps when I needed to. That's fucking that is awesome. That is awesome. And and um so did you get to did you get to work on the um, on the on the Celtic Frost re-releases? Is that well? So they were uh, they were all kind of in production already. So they they were basically when I arrived, they, they were just about to be. They just came back from the manufacturers, and so they'd had a bit of a tempestuous ride with Tom. I think Tom, bless him, he his catalogue's been passed from here to there. And he's dealt with people at Universal and Sanctuary that don't know who his band are and don't recognise how special they are in the whole sort of metal framework, you know. And he frustrates him a little bit and he's apparently, because like the guy that put them together is like, oh, it looks after the Trojan catalogue, you know, so he hasn't got a clue about Celtic Cross. Although Hugh Gilmore, um, who's a big metal artist, designer guy, he did a lot of the, well, he did all the artwork and he did a lot of the tune and crying with Tom and Tom provided all these demos and lots of old photos and you know he insisted on these things being the Celtic Frost reissues Wendell reissues you know and so hence they've got a block in them they've got like two posters they're really big big products and people learn about the price but they're not cheap to make yeah um, so I think everything was quite rosy and so Tom was writing the sleeve notes and uh, and he said stuff, in my humble opinion, that sat out there in the public domain. If you've read his book, Are You Morbid? It's all in there. Parts of it are in his other book, Only Death Is Real. And he just told about the, fric- you know, the friction that there was between him and Carl Walterback. Yeah. And he put it down in these sleeve notes. And um, I'll leave with the part and we're like, no, we can't. They can't go out. Can you edit them? And he refused. Yeah. And... Uh, Toys out the pram, disowned the whole project, wouldn't get on with it, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be involved anymore. So I arrived and I um, said, Look, get in touch with this Tom G guy, you know about them. See if you can get into some interviews. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, right. So I emailed his manager and, and, and she must have forwarded the email over and I got this quite curt email back from him saying, It was just a, oh, this stock's arrived, would you like some copies, you know, this abomination of my work, blah, blah, blah. He was quite angry. We didn't get off on the right foot, but then I just told him about the times I'd seen Kelly Frost. I'd been to one of their signing sessions with Shades when I was a teenager, you know. Yeah. And after that, it was, we had a good working relationship. And speak, you know, he was very professional. He did everything that was asked of him. Oh wow, and, really? Yeah, yeah. He did every interview we threw at him. So you, t- so I mean, you, t- you turn. Oh, every interview you threw at him, and not one for your old mate with a fucking podcast. You fucking cunt. <laughs> 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 I wasn't doing the PR, mate. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay, mate. Seriously. <laughs> too. Um, but um, but that, that's awesome. That you, that you went from having that that um, kind of it's an abomination email to to, well, to doing all the interviews that you set up for him and everything. I think that's, I mean, that's yeah. a hell of a turnaround. Yeah, it was, you know, he was upset that his work had been curtailed. And I think he just, he had poor sense of chicken all of that. And that's fair comment. You know, the guy's an artist. And, um, and I think, you know, yeah, but the, the, what, the frustrating me, thing... I would, have let those, I would have let those things go. There wasn't really that much defamation in them, but I think there was just a nervousness. That I think basically because it's a large company, people think that you could be targeted for libel more than if it was some little DIY indie, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but, but, yeah, but also, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm no lawyer, but um, I would have thought that if what he said is also out there in two books, then there's your fucking defence straight away. Indeed, um, indeed. And, and also, this all happened before I joined, so I was yeah. kind of walked into this storm, you know. And I was yeah, like, but it's, it, I just find it really frustrating from a fan's point of view that something so, let's be honest, let's be really, really honest, when it comes to a re-release, and I know you wrote them for Death Row, so I'm in no way pissing on your legacy, but the sleeve notes are not the top of anybody's list 
when they're getting no. the new the new you know this new package they want to look yeah. at the artwork they want to look they want to look at what songs available any posters um read the lyrics if it's the first chance they've had to read the lyrics and more importantly get that stuff on and see what it sounds like now and see how the remasters have changed it and what they've done to it and revisit those yeah. old songs and stuff like that and to be honest the last thing you're thinking about is oh i wonder i i, I wonder where they rehearsed before this album I mean, you know, to his credit, Tom did meticulously with uh, one of the members of Tripticon remaster these. You know, they'd been through them with a tooth comb and fixing every little pop and crack. You know, these are the definitive remasters done to his specifications, um, as is the artwork. So you'll notice the cover of Megatherion slightly different. He never wanted the logo over the top of the artwork, you see. Right. Um, so it was, it was laid up in the style that he wanted it to be. And um, and then you know people have been bemoaning. Oh, where's Emperor's Return? Well, Emperor's Return was never supposed to come out. That was that was a demo that they did, and Carl just put it out on a record. And so in the sequence of things, it was part of Megatherion, so they released it as part of that. You know, it's added morbid tales to encompass these rehearsal tapes that he kindly brought to the table. So, um, uh, well, actually, thank you very thank you very much for refreshing my men my memory of uh, of the other things I need. I'm going to have to send you a message. Because I definitely need, I definitely need to Megatherion, em, uh, Emperor's Return, and Morbid Tales. Well, so well, Emperor's Return is part of to Megatherion. It's a double album. Brilliant. Well, it's another extra bit. So that's how he wanted it to be. He, that was, and I think if you read back through all Cabot's Lost books and stuff like that, he always had a vision of how these records would play out. He even had the titles of the records, I think, in a sequence. And so Emperor's Return was never really meant to be an official Celtic Cross release. Um, and they tracked down some rare stuff. I don't know if you... There's an old sound 7-inch that had a different mix of visual aggression on it. That They got a hold of that and managed to get it on the record. And oh, yeah. yeah, it's cool. I mean, it is, you know, it's, everything's there. And the one glaring omission, Cold Lake. He asked for it not to be released. Yeah. And we respected his wishes. And you know, to be... To he asked for it not to be released. Uh, and you all thought, what a fucking great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got a copy anyway. Well, I, look... I could live the rest of my life without ever hearing fucking Cherry Orchards again. <laughs> um, I think Tom could as well, to be fair. Well, funnily enough, yeah, and 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 I I I I, uh, I, I um, had a, did a, had a chat with Xavier Russell a while back, and he was telling me um, he was telling me because he ended he did the video for Cherry Orchards. Right, he directed it, didn't he? Yeah, 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 and he was telling me all about it. You know, it's this farcical video shoot and everything else. So it was just like fucking hell. Well, he he, he contributed the sleeve notes. He, he did sleeve notes for these records because he's good friends with the band. Um, so I think that's, we had to remove Tom's sleeve notes. Xavier stepped in and wrote Tom as well. I mean, that's that's really cool, and I'm just I'm just disappointed that ultimately it's like Tom. What we'd really like to hear is all about you know the lead up to the album, the recording, or and and you don't have to use it as yet another as another opportunity. To to have a go at Carl, we get it. You didn't get on, yeah, I, you know. It's... You know what? I did see them, and it wasn't an all-out attack. It was just a few remarks, right. uh, but people were un uneasy about it, and it didn't go in. And I think it's a crying shame, personally. I think it should have stayed, but that's that's my opinion, and I'm not a lawyer, so yeah. And I, as I say, I don't, you know, it's not a, it's not a new story. You know, anyone that's into Kermit Frost has read those books. Has read it online, and. You know, they know that story and they know the friction between the two. Well, there's, I, mean, I know D D David Gielke was, um, was, was coming towards the end of writing the book and there was no Tom in it. And he kind of decided at the last minute to, to, to acquiesce and agreed to, do, agreed to do an interview for it. Um, right, OK. And, um, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, whatever, he, whatever he said in the sleeve notes he gave you, there was definitely nothing worse than, <laughs> than, than what's in that book. Exactly, and that got published. So you know, yes, I think I think Carl's kind of used to it. I, I did hear that someone did email Carl, and, and he just kind of wrote back saying, oh, "Whatever, you know." But, yeah, yeah. Someone had someone further up the food chain decided it wasn't a good idea, and, and it and it did incur um, um, Tom's wrath because I mean he had a vision, and he had a vision, and, you know, and his, his vision didn't get fulfilled in the end, which I'm I'm kind of sad for him because you know. Yeah, but it, yeah, but it, records, but yeah, yeah. but it kind of did, didn't it? Because ultimately, yeah. the artwork is correct. They are, they sound, 
you know, they sound better than they ever have done before and all the rest of it. So, yeah. do you know what I mean? As I said, I don't think I don't, I don't think there's anyone going, right, I'm not buying those because it hasn't got Tom Warrior's sleeve notes in it. Well, he, he did disown them and there's a lot of people that said they wouldn't on that basis. Yeah, and and what I find with people who take who take um, uh, moral positions online, um, then go and buy them anyway. Yeah, I don't really know, and they've you know they've they've sold they've sold well, and I think there's new legions of people discovering Celtic Frost all the time. I don't know about you, but I'm I'm waiting for the Roadburn Day tickets to go on sale so I can go and see you do the Requiem Rex is performing it live. Oh, now that's going to be mental. Yeah, I need to see it. I need to see it. So, um, uh, I mean, is there any? Is there anything else? Is there anything else to come out of the uh, of the noise vault? Or what are we waiting on? Well, um, I mean, obviously, BMG are kind of, you know, being a large company, they're only interested in titles that will sell X. Um, I think of all the big sort of uh, big early bands. Pretty much done them now. We've done bankers. We 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 lost rights to the first three Coroner albums. That they recently were reissued by Century Media. We did the last two about a month after those came out. Um, we did some great digger stuff. Uh, Death Row, Halloween, Skyclad. So that is kind of sat dormant. Um, sort of. There's a lot of tension. That's well. I, this is basically. I don't think the members want it to come out anymore. They're kind of over all the arguments and so that's respect doesn't really respect their wishes. It, it sort of stays where it is. Um, which is kind of a shame, but you know they were reissued I think by Sanctuary some ten years ago and, and really mastered uh, yeah. by any sleep. So they're kind of in, in their eyes that's their definitive versions of those. But yeah there's not a lot left. We're talking about maybe some Camelot next year. They're still big and there's we're looking at sort of late 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 nineties kind of power metal that the noise sort of had a bit of an upturn with uh, creative box set possibly. I thought you just um, uh, I think you just came up with a really cool new word, which is a, a period of time, which is the lateies. <laughs> the lateies, <laughs> which is official, which is officially sort of eighty seven to ninety that. Uh, or eighty six to ninety, the, the like the the real perfect era for thrash took place in the eighties. Um... Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's 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 not it's not over and done with yet. But I think what we're doing as well is we're finding licensing partners for some of the smaller titles. Right. So we've been doing teaming up with like Music and Vinyl, and they've been doing stuff like Ben Better, Watchtower, uh, and they do beautiful packages as well. And they only do some limited runs, like five hundred or a thousand, and they're yeah. hand numbered, and they're always like cut vinyl with nice inserts and stuff. Um, so they're doing a really good job. So a lot of the stuff, I mean, they've done quite a lot of sinner reissues because we didn't feel that was kind of really what we wanted to do. Um, and there'll be some more titles going out to them. I mean, going through the list, there's a lot of stuff that went over my head at the time. I'll be honest with you, but it's all the big ones I remember, like you know, it's with Turbo. And Death were another one of the more obscure noise bands, DAM. Yeah. Someone's been reissuing DAM. Um, they're still a going concern. So we might, yeah, at least get licensed out. Um, but we make sure that the partners we work with do them well. Yeah, and and I mean that makes absolute sense that you that you kind of you know do the headline the headline bands and one of them that we haven't kind of got round to yet is um we we I mean by the sounds of it you weren't that involved with Voivod that was all done by the time you came in. Yeah, it was still manufacturer stuff, and that was my, that was my very first marketing job with that. So I worked really closely with uh, Away. Michelle is such a lovely fellow. We brought him over for the Prog Awards. He won a Prog Award last year. I remember. So, yeah, we got to hang out a bit, and he's such a sound guy. And it was, you know, those boys were because just channel those three, and uh, that provided all that extra fantastic video footage you saw. I mean, all. Yeah. DVD creation is quite a painful process, particularly with the whole sort of global certification of it. Yeah. It'd be quite a headache. But uh, yeah, it was well worth doing. And uh, they've they really gone down well with the fans. Oh, well, they, they, and uh, think... yeah. And, and also, they sound fucking great. I mean, I mean, Dimension Hatros sounded ahead of its time at the time. And the weird thing is, yeah. with a remaster, that thing sounds like it came out like last year. I know, I know, it's incredible, isn't it? Well, the guy that's responsible for pretty much all of those remasters, besides Celtic Frost, they kind of did in-house, is a guy called Andy Pierce, and um, 
he's like a big sort of remastering guy. He's done like Black Sabbath and Motorhead. So he's done, he's been, he's worked with the Crown Jewels. So he's kind of like a trusted guy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's, he's got a great ear for this stuff. He just knows how to lift it up and just polish it up that little bit, you know. I mean, all those creative records are so fat now. I don't know if you've heard of the second batch of reissues we did, because we did, um, after that, we did Coma Souls, Renewal. And then we did two that weren't specifically noise titles, but had come into us by creators. So we did Cause of Conflict and Outcast as well. And that Cause of Conflict record sounds absolutely like razor wire in your ears. I was just, gonna, I was just, I'm going to add that to the, I'm going to add that to the list because that is an absolute banger. Yeah. That that album is an absolute banger. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Renewal. I remember that. Indus- Industrial was pretty big around then. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, that uh, was kind of more of a hardcore record. They think they've been out on the road with Biohazard and came back and were like, "That's right." There's, there's like a raw power cover on it and stuff like that. So they went for a real kind of hardcore sound, which is quite interesting. Um, and and it's funny because along the way, because I wasn't involved in some of the earlier stuff, I was like. Well, there's tracks missing from some of this. You've missed out Gangland, which was the B-side of the uh, Behind the Mirror 12-inch. Yeah. It's like a time of the Pantang cover, and that got missed somewhere, so I released that as a record store day pitch disc. And um, just a couple of weeks ago, we put out that limited edition version of Pleasure to Kill that had an extra track on it called After the Attack. Yeah. So we've got that back out now. Uh, it's, it's just really cool. It's, it is just... Getting everything back out there. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of other albums that aren't, th- th- this is the this is the one that's missing for me. Does anybody know where Nothing Face is? Uh, MCA, so Universal, maybe. That's that's a fucker. That is because that is locked. Yeah. Because that's locked away with Angel Rat and uh, yeah. be- and Beyond the um, the Outer Limits. Yeah, all that when they left Noise, because I think it was kind of it was co-released with Noise. It was MCA. It was, it was MCA Mechanics. Yeah, yeah, that's Steve, so, Steve Sinclair, I think. Yeah, it's. I think it's. Um, I think it's Universal. It'll be in their vault. But see, a lot of these big companies like Universal, they don't even know they own this stuff. Uh, hello, uh, I'm. 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 I'm on. Universal and uh, they've been collecting all our digital royalties because they thought that they owned our digital royalties. And I had to have a conversation. <laughs> I had to have a conversation with uh, the legal department in New York and say, "I think you'll find um, that, that I have a contract here that specifically states that the Apple Core Archives is a CD only release. And right. That is all you are entitled to." Um, and, yeah. to, and to be fair, they put their hands up straight away and went, look, totally sorry, genuine mistake. We went yeah. through a load of this stuff and, and it was all, you know, it was physical and digital. Everything was physical and digital. So rather than review every single contract, we just had to make a decision at some point that, yeah. right. I mean, it's exactly what I would have done. Do you know what I mean? You put it all out, it, you know, if, 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 you, if, if you don't know what you own, well, put it out, and if somebody says you don't own it, you'll soon find out. You do. They come out of the woodwork, that's for sure. Um, it's interesting because sometimes, particularly with noise, finding whether it's... I mean, most of the stuff was signed, signed in perpetuity, you know, and so they signed their life away. But some stuff not, and some along the line... I mean, apparently, yeah, all the original contracts are in German, obviously, and they're in a vault in our German branch somewhere, um, but they're, they're they're incomplete. Some of them, some are missing, and so if there's like coroner, basically their paperwork is missing. So it had to be back to them. We didn't have a leg to stand on. Just, yeah. And it's not worth arguing with someone. Okay, the paperwork's not here. There you go. You vote back. You know. Yeah. It's not worth getting heated over. Well, um, no, absolutely. And I think I, I, that was certainly Universal's approach because I because I said, well, look, you know. They said, can you send us a copy of your... Can you send us a copy of the contract as we don't have one? I was like, right. So you have no paperwork saying that you have ownership yeah. of any of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, 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 if someone internally just got around to putting them up, it's probably some intern's job that looks just like, here's a list of stuff, put them up on Spotify, you know. Yeah. Uh, and they'll come back to us if they own it, you know. 
know, it's well, that, probably I, kind of the approach. It, it's the be- but it's the best way to find bands, really, isn't it? It's it's to, yeah. to actually put it out because if you know you could spend years trying to track them down and you know some people only go and check their emails once a month at the library, so <laughs> so um, I mean you may as well just stick it out there and you'll soon find out who's going to lay claim to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I've been doing because it's, it's, I mean there's so much noise stuff that's not available digitally that it's it's a, a mountainous job to get through. So. What I've been doing is when we've done, obviously, the stuff we reissue, we put out digitally as well, but the, the, the sort of smaller releases that we've licensed out to music on vinyl, I was just tying with their release date and put it up digitally on that day, you know, so gradually we're kind of working through it. Right, okay. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a hard job, but there's just a lot of it. I mean, finding some of the, even getting a CD to rip can be an expensive business, you know, like you try and find one of the singer albums and they're only going to like £35 on Discogs, you know. Right. And then, and bear in mind, a lot of this is vinyl, so the, the Death Row never actually had a CD release, so we had to master it from vinyl. Well, I had I had Deception Ignored on CD. Yeah, I think that the early albums weren't. Right. Cause it was 86, you know, and they by the time CDs had come in, they probably weren't deemed worth putting back out with CDs, you know, where something like Creator, obviously, is covered and selling. Yeah, 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 some of the fun guys who work with Tank, they're lovely, but they're a lovely bunch. Been really fun to work with. Um, yeah, I mean, the tankers are a weird one because it's like they're they're, they're still going. They they they've still got a, an audience, but they just kind of dip in and dip out, don't they? Yeah, well, they, apparently they've never been a full time band ever. Yeah, and they all work still, and they go out and they play. I don't know, fifty odd shows a year. Sometimes it's like right up to Japan, right up to South America. There's still an audience for them, but they, they just make sure that they play things that matter. You know, they don't trot around doing massive tours, but every other weekend they'll be playing somewhere. You know, yeah. I met up with their manager in London a few months ago, and uh, they just played on the pitch at a cup final in Frankfurt. They were chosen to do this kind of comedy right. anthem that's like one of the Frankfurt songs, you know, I don't know, like football song. And yeah. they were picked to do it, and they were over the moon. Well, it's fun, funnily enough, Xavier Russell told me told me the same story because he he was at, he, he was actually at the cup final. Right there, you go. Yeah, because he's a huge, huge tankard fan. Yeah, yeah, he stays in touch with them quite a bit, I think. And Buffalo, their manager, is a really cool guy. It's funny because you realise you were in the same room as people way back. You know, I was like, I was at that show. It's like me too. You know. Yeah, that now that all that, those years ago. <laughs> that, that is a that is an experience that people of our age are constantly having. Um, yeah. it's good. I mean, Pete, Pete and I have done that a few times, other than, you know, being in the same room as in he was an Acid Rain gig and I was on stage and he was in the crowd. Um, yeah. But um, funnily enough, I interviewed the guys from Akakoka a while back and um, uh-huh. and two of them were in the, were, were in the front row um, when we were supporting Flotsam and Jetsam and one of them got thrown out for stage diving like halfway through Goddess, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I noticed you put a thing up on, on the Acid Rain Facebook, or maybe it was your own one the other day. It's like, you know, which band have you seen the most? And I was like, well, if you'd asked me this in the, in the 90s, it would be Acid Rain. I think, I don't know, over 20 times. Bloody hell. Easy, easy. We did a lot of support. Wow. That is that. We, we, I have had plenty of money off you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Fuck knows what I did with it. Um, <laughs> dear me. Um, so, um, so when you, when you do a digital time with, with, so, so some stuff you're only going to release digitally, uh, but you will give the physical to a, a smaller label to do a nice little, um, a, a, a nice little, uh, reissue, push or, on it, yeah. reissue or something like that. And it's, it's not worth you doing it, but it is worth them doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, we're a large sort of heading toward being a corporate machine and, you know, it's all about volumes and all this kind of stuff so there's a there's a sort of line that things kind of you know it's got it's it should you aim to be above this point sales wise and it's you know it's, it's it goes against all my sort of diy ethics but let's check that in at the door but um yeah so you know these records still deserve to be out there so we work closely with a lot of labels like people like high roller they license stuff from us um as do back on black vinyl people like that yeah, as long as they do a good job, we've, we've only been working with music on vinyl so far on the noise. We we're kind of only doing it slowly, bit by bit, with them. But they are doing a great job, and the distribution network's fantastic, so they get stuff all over the globe. You know, 
and then it gets really dreadful back out again. Yeah, absolutely, and people get a uh, people get a chance to um, to own them to actually own them on vinyl as well. Um, yeah, you know. some of this stuff was going for absolute silly money. I mean, um, for example, when we did the came to do the coroner two reissues, we did we did uh, Mental Vortex and Grin. Now that was kind of they were done around the early to mid nineties when the whole vinyl thing was really fading out. So they had a limited vinyl release, but it was predominantly CD. Now, to buy a copy of one of these on Discogs was about £150. We had to do it to get the artwork. But never mind now. You've devalued them. Well, there you go. Well, <laughs> Sorry well, about that. Yeah, but, yeah, but you, can, you can't win, can you? Because, you know, one set of people who are collectors say you've devalued them, whereas everyone else actually gets to now have one because they're too fucking expensive for anyone to buy. Exactly. I mean, if you were to buy a copy of R.I.P., that was like yeah i mean that's just ridiculous but um funnily enough um i know crash records in leeds uh scott who works there is absolutely over the moon with uh with your coronary issues um because he's one he's for years he's been trying to get older grin um, oh right okay yeah there was a lot of people that were quite excited about that particularly on vinyl because you know it was so hard to find the other three not so much it's a pity because I, I did buy the century media media reissue of RIP, and it's it's quite poor in comparison to the ones we did. And that's not just blowing our own trumpet. It's, yeah, there's nothing of it. There's no in the sea. There's no in the sea lyrics. There's no nothing. Yeah, that's that's not great. I mean, you want you yeah. want some serious, you want some serious fucking um, uh, packaging. Now that's that's part of the reason for for bothering to get a reissue. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think it's one thing that we're, we're actively encouraged to experiment with packaging and, um, you know, really push the envelope with stuff. And it's fun because we're given a remit, you know, I think a lot of the labels, the pages look up to us and go, wow, you did some bad stuff. It's like, yeah, you know, it's a bit of like vinyl fetish, you know, fetishization of vinyl. I collect vinyl, and I, so I make it the, like, uh, the way I'd like to buy it. So that's kind of my viewpoint. You know, and we think about all the colours we're going to do them in, and you know, like the creator stuff's all done on stuff called reverse boards. So it's got this lovely coarse finish to it with a lovely varnish over the top. It's not just a regular album sleeve. And the triple, like you know, you've got some of the triple fold out. Amazing. And all the artwork's printed down the creases so that nothing you don't get like white strips or anything like that. We take a lot of care and attention when we make this stuff. Well, by the sounds of it, more attention than Noise did when they made them originally. Some of their artwork farms are, uh, are quite fun, and then we've got to do some creative license of our own. I've done two box sets recently, not trash, but um, I've got a Halloween box set, right? Yeah, um, of all the noise stuff. So it's got the first mini album, the Judas EP, Walls of Jericho, Keepers One and Two, and the best of the rest, the rare, all in a lovely box designed by um, the wonderful James Isaacs, who used to work at Metal Hammer and Classic Rock doing all their artwork. Oh, well, so that's, that's all worked out nicely, then. Yeah, yeah, they've done a fantastic job. So I think some of the, you know, the, the CD side of the Halloween catalogue's been pretty exhausted, but the vinyl side's been ignored, so it was good to get some of these back out again, particularly those first couple, you know. Yeah. Uh, the Judas 12 inch is quite hard to find, and the box is without buying me on trumpet. It looks really cool. And we put a slip mat in it as well, a pumpkin slip mat. <laughs> for the vinyl nerds. It, but it, it, it's getting to the stage now where I think every Halloween release has been released, um, yeah, just more times than you're aware of. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Own Sanctuary overkilled it a bit, so we're, we're, we're not looking to exploit it too much, but we did that with, after conversations with the bands. They were like, yeah, vinyl box, I think the time is right, particularly with the whole pub can do uh, United thing, you know. And so we did them all on nice colour vinyl, and they're all sort of the latest remasters and did it with complete, you know, and we the, the version of uh, the best of the rest of the rare. We changed the track listing slightly because I felt there were some tracks, other tr- bonus tracks missing that could go on it because some of it was duplicated with stuff on the other records. It's only a slight tweak, but there's some different mixes and stuff on there. So it's it's supposed to be the definitive everything from noise in one box. But the question we do keep getting asked is that is live in the UK. And it's a bit like nothing face. It's lost in a major vault somewhere. Ah, that's yeah, it doesn't belong to us. So, um, so did you say you've put Cause for Conflict out? Yeah, that came out um, 
earlier this year. I think it came out in about January or February. So right, that, that's really weird because on your um, it, it's not on your website. Oh yeah, the website for that update. <laughs> right. Yeah, bane of our life that is. Really? Yeah, it's really out of date. That is. Oh, that's... I keep change it. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although I, although I suppose it's, I don't know, you know, I, I, I say on most podcasts now, you know, I mention websites, like, but like anyone fucking uses websites anymore. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you follow the Facebook page, that's kind of where all the stuff goes on. Been, yeah, no, I've seen you've, got, I've seen you've got some decent social media as well. I mean, and like, you know, weighty number of, um, uh, of followers. And, yeah, um, yeah. In fact, I've got some. In fact, I've got some business stuff to talk to you about. So I'll tell you what. Okay. Why don't we? Um, I've also got some questions from um, uh, Patreon um, subscribers for you as well. But um, for now, um, uh, Miles, thank you very yep. much for your time. Really appreciate it. And on behalf of all the listeners, thank you for your fine work on the Noise Catalogue. Thank you very much. Actually, it's been good to talk about them. It's been fun. It's been a, a childhood dream. I keep waking up every morning pinching myself, right? Oh, my God, I'm working on this. I am cheap. <laughs> that's all. Well, that's awesome, and that is exactly why you're the right man to do it. No, son, thank you. Cheers, thank you. What a lovely man. What a lovely, lovely man uh, Miles is. And strangely, whilst um, whilst I've been putting this podcast together, I've um, I've been messaging with him as well. Isn't that funny? Um, so there you go. Can I have, another, have a little uh, chat with him this week? Fascinating. Um, fascinated, I'm sure you all are. Um so we're kind of coming down, um, winding down towards the end of the podcast. Um, and as always, it is, um, you know, I really, uh, as always, I appreciate being in your ears. Always have, always will, always do. Um, now, I have announced another um, live show. I'm going to be coming down to Hobo's in um, Bridge End. That is on March the, he says, uh, I, I'm so disorganised. I mean, you know, doing, 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 uh, pushing my own shows, I should at least know when they're on. Um, and where have I got it there? Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Right, it's actually fallen out of my phone altogether. That's brilliant, isn't it? So I've got no idea what... This is awesome, isn't it? Do you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to make you listen to this. Hang on a second. And it fucking was in my diary. I was staring right at it. March the 28th, which is the Thursday. Thursday, March 28th, down at Hobo's. Tickets are eight quid. Um, come along and hear the uh, tales from the Book of Thrash stories. Um, I will be... Um, uh, and, and the people who came to the live podcast also got to hear... A few of my, uh, well, well, some of them finally got to hear the Phil Anselmo story um, and uh, and a few others as well. Um, so there you go. Always worth popping along. Although that doesn't form part of the uh, Tales from Book of Thrash thing because it's not really a podcast or podcasty thing. But if any of you are around, it would be lovely to see you. Um, Thanks all for your support over the um, over the years. It's been it's been five years. I cannot believe it. The amount of people that I've had on and the amount of people um, that I've got to know through the podcast that are now having an effect from a business point of view, you know, trying to get the whole acid rain thing rolled out. We've got four final mixes very nearly finished. So um, things are happen- things are happening there. Um, and it's looking exciting. But anyway, look, I don't want to go off a... I, oh, too late. Tangent. There you go. Got, you got yourselves an acid rain tangent there. Not exactly a tangent, because that is pretty much all I ever fucking talk about, isn't it? <laughs> um, but look, I, I hope you had a great Christmas. I hope 2019 is looking good. Um, there is some fucking brilliant... I was going to say brilliant albums due out this year, but don't know if they're brilliant yet. What a stupid thing to say. What a fucking dickhead I really am. Um... But um, yeah, there's, uh, there's, uh, let's, there's hoping 2019 is the possibility of being fucking massive. Do you know what? I've, j- I've just remembered that I could have had of one of as one of my albums of the year, the Voivod album. Um, but it, it's I don't know. Every time I play it, I think I like this. It, yeah, this is good. And then I just never want to play it again. It's weird. Um, I don't know. I prefer it more. I prefer it to the to the the previous album, but I don't know. There's still something there that's not happening for me. 
about it and I don't know what it is. But anyway, again, another tangent. Um, coming to the end of the podcast, really do appreciate it, guys. You are going to be getting an extra one this month, so this one's not massively long, but you will be getting the um, the live podcast uh, at some point in February as well. You lucky, lucky bastards. And if you're uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber, wow, you get you already have the uh, the live podcast. You're going to get in this early. You're going to get your own podcast. I've gone on about Patreon a bit too much on this show. I think, haven't I? Yes, you have, Howard. You've come across like some fucking money-hungry cunt and you should fucking pack it in before everybody fucks off and leaves you and never listens to your podcast again, you wanker. There we go. I thought I'd save you the trouble of having to uh, fucking tweet me that. <laughs> anyway, folks, I'm dragging this out here. Let's um, uh, let's say goodbye. It's going to be a little while until the next podcast. It's not. It's going to be a month. It's always a month. And you're going to get another one... Um, dropping very soon as well quite when that is i don't know but that is going to drop at some point soon so all that remains for me to say is thank you very much for listening wherever you are in the world hope you're looking after yourself i hope 2019 is gonna be a, an awesome year for you and um i'm hoping it's going to be an awesome year for me as well to be honest so on that note let's all make 29 awesome and I thought that would be a really cool way of finishing the podcast. And then I've just realised that I've said, let's make 29. What, <laughs> what fucking year is that? You absolute dick-steaming twat, Howard. I do apologise, everyone. Let's make 2019 awesome. Yeah? Nearly as awesome as 29. Fucking honestly, what a fucking idiot.